Logan, you hit the button. Sup, freaks? It's your boy Marty here to introduce this rip of TFTC. I sat down with Mark Moss. We had a incredible, wide-ranging conversation. He just wrote a book with Alex Fetzi, The Uncommunist Manifesto, Lighting Fires in the Minds of Men. Highly recommend you guys check it out. You should also check out Unchained Capital. Right down the hall from us here at the Bitcoin Commons. They're draining the exchanges until September 8th, running a special promo. If you uh, set up a vault, they're waiving the $1,000 um, know, automatic buy of the Bitcoin to set up a vault. They're offering it for $250 now. This white glove concierge service is going to take you from zero to having a two or three multi-sig setup of which you hold two keys. If you use the code TFTC, you're going to get $50 off that $250 concierge service. Um, they're also offering um, a lower onboarding fee for their IRA product as well, 250 as well. If you use the code TFTC, you're going to get $50 off that too. I don't want to say as well too many times in a row. Um, go to unchained.com slash concierge to check this all out. And if you have a single point of failure in your custody model, you're holding on your Bitcoin on an exchange or in a single SIG wallet, Unchained is here to help you eliminate those single points of failure. Unchained.com slash concierge. Use the code TFTC. This trip is also brought to you by our good friends by at Brains. We're a few days away from slush pool transitioning to Brains Pool. Um, and I actually wrote the forward to a Bitcoin mining handbook that the Brains, Brains team wrote. Uh, very honored to have done this. You go to brains.com, check out everything they have going on. Uh, they help you idiot proof your mining operation. If you have an ASICs that is compatible with their Brains OS Plus firmware, which allows you to download a new firmware on your ASIC and make it more efficient and al uh, allow you to produce more hashes, which then allows you to pr produce more sats. Uh, again, it idiot proofs your mining operation. If you have an ASIC that's compatible with Brains OS Plus and you're not using it, you're an idiot because you're leaving sats on the table. Only it is. Idiots do that. Don't do that. Go to brains.com, B-R-A-I-I-N-S.com. Uh, check out the firmware. If it's compatible with your ASIC, download it. Check out Brains Pool. Check out Brains Insights. Check out the books that they're producing, the content they're producing. Incredible team. This was also brought to you by our good friends at HODL HODL. HODL HODL is here to bring you a lending platform with no KYC, no AML. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. What you do is you put your Bitcoin up as collateral on a two or three multi-sig escrow. You hold one key, your counterparty in the loan holds one key, and HODL HODL holds the third key. Um, you don't have control over the Bitcoin, obviously, since you only have one key in that two or three quorum. However, you have visibility into the loan, so you know your sats aren't being rehypothecated. As long as you're paying back your uh, loan plus the interest associated with it, you're going to get your sats back at the end of the day. Bitcoin is collateral. You get stable coins in return. Peer-to-peer, -peer, no KYC, no AML. Go to lend.hodlhodl.com. This rip was also brought to you by our good friends at Upstream Data. Upstream Data is here to take care of all your mining needs. If you're an at-home miner, they have their black boxes. You put a couple miners in, and it takes the noise from... to Great for the sound. Your wife doesn't like the sound. Your HOA doesn't like the sound. You buy a black box. You put your ASICs in the black box, and it takes care of the sound. Also takes care of the heat. It's going to make sure that your miners don't crap out from, from being too hot. They've got good airflow. Uh, go to shop.upstreamdata.ca to check out the black box. If you use the code FREAKS, F-R-E-A-K-S, you're going to get 5% off the black box. They're also selling uh, bigger, more industrial size mining uh, containers. Uh, if you're in the oil field, you're sitting on some pretty profits. You're looking to diversify into Bitcoin mining. ASICs are pretty cheap. And then upstream data is there for all your needs. They build the data centers, they build the generators, uh, and they can acquire the miners for you. So go to upstreamdata.ca to check that out. Tell them that TFTC sent you. If you do do some inquiry into their hash shots, I'm a hash shot co customer. I have a 50 kilowatt hash shot uh, that has been running flawlessly since I plugged it in uh, in the beginning of this year. Uh, incredible product, incredible team really helping to distribute hash rate and empower power producers, whether you're a utility company or an upstream oil and gas company, to turn your wasted assets, whether it be excess electricity or stranded natural gas, into Bitcoin. Upstreamdata.ca. Enjoy this riff, Freaks. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free, if you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that 
In a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. Probably should be. Probably should be. All right, we're back. We're talking about surfing. Talking about surfing. Yeah, Drew, uh, he had a rough go of it. Um, it's crazy. They put him on a ventilator. He was on one. They put him in a coma. Yeah, they put him in a coma. Yeah. Yeah. He was down for like a month, the better part of a month, I think. Yeah. Yeah. He got messed up pretty bad. Yeah. It was crazy, though. He's like one of those people that has that crazy drive. Thought he was never going to surf again. Then he posted uh, on his newsletter and Instagram last week. He got in the water and was, he was like, Yeah, I looked like a kook. I had uh, yeah. like um, a life vest on. He caught like eight waves, he said. Right yeah. Then. The human drive. Yeah. It's freaking powerful. It is. The human drive is powerful. And he uh he embodies that. Like like we were saying, he was on a ventilator, he was in a coma for a month, couldn't walk for like a month after he came out of it. And yeah. This is only like six months ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's like I was saying earlier, like I've had six major surgeries. Have I've had metal in every limb of my body? My wrist is screwed back together, rods in my legs. I just have now my new hip. Um and it's just one of those things where you're just like well, let me let me try that again. <laughs> <laughs> does it get harder as you get older? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. You know, but like Drew, right. right? Where he's just like, all right, well, that sucked. <laughs> let me get out of this coma. Let me dust it off and like let's let's get at it again, right? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I, I'm I'm interested to see if there's any uh inspiration as art that comes out of this. Mm, I'm sure they're good. Yeah. So he's for everyone listening. He's an amazing artist. Yeah. He got his start, right, with like Lost Surfboards got going. Mm -hmm. He was doing all the art on the Lost Surfboards. So that's like all from my hometown, right? Like, yeah. So that's like, I kind of grew up in that culture. Uh, yeah, it's just amazing surf art. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's uh, done boards for like Mason Ho and a bunch of those pros. So. Yeah. Yeah, now he's got a pretty cool art gallery in town. Yeah. Check out Drew Brophy, his art. It's my second cousin. Powerful. One day we'll have to get you out there. You can reunite with them and we'll get you in the ways. <clears throat> yeah, my brother's been out there and stayed at their place. He says it's awesome. And the ways in San Clemente, my brother described, it's like very, very surfable. They're the best. Now I'm totally doxxed. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, now I'm totally doxxed. Uh, I'm already freaking doxxed online. But, um, you know, uh, I mean, whatever, talking about surfing, but we probably have out of 365 days a year, we probably have. 360 days that you could surf. That's incredible. Like every day there's pretty much waves, right? Like maybe the 10 days a year you can't, but there's always something. Um, and uh, kind of like in Hawaii on the North shore, they call it like the seven mile miracle. Mm -hmm. Like we kind of, San Clemente is whatever, 15 miles long, 20 miles long. And we have like some of the best waves in the world just right there. <sighs> waves are like a natural phenomenon right? So like just right there, we have all those waves. Like we have like 15 marquee waves, some of the best waves in the world, but then all the way down to San Diego, nothing. you hardly have a couple. Yeah. Right? And then, and then into Baja, you get into, Mex into Mexico and I do dirt bike tours down there for 17 years. I've covered every single mile multiple times and you have a thousand, well, about 800 miles of coastline. And, uh, there's like eh, five waves a thousand miles of coastline talking about the mexican pipeline in puerto escondido you have like uh the mexican pipeline and waves will come in you know 20 foot 30 foot but just there not a mile to the north not a mile to the south just right there yeah insane now to say uh, i've been up in jersey all summer i grew up going to the shore down there and surfing down there and that's the one thing about jersey waves they're very uh they're not consistent year in year out like last year was an incredible surfing summer this year it's been lake atlantic it's yeah no swell i've never been but what we need to do now now that i'm a part-time austin person <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that but uh we gotta with an hour and a half we can get up to waco yeah hit, hit that wave park yeah i've been there three times it's pretty cool is it uh does it feel like a surfing experience it does. It's it's a little different, but it's but it's close enough. Yeah. Um, they have a they have a beginner, intermediate, and an advanced wave. And uh, advanced wave is pretty fun. It's short. You get like two three turns, but um, it's a little bit different. It's a little weird. Um, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like you drop in and then like a blindfold is is pulled off, and all of a sudden like there's like this wave. But you get two or three wave two or three turns. It's fun. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's what, uh, you can go get like, you can go get like 40, 50 waves in like an hour. That's yeah. That's like the beauty of those wave parks. Yeah. Like you're not waiting. Yeah. You, you know exactly where it's going to break and you just set up. Yeah. One of my other really good friends who's also friends with Drew, um, from North Carolina, right? Or South Carolina. South Carolina. South Carolina. Um, so he's also lives in California. He's, but friends from, from, with Drew from back there, we do a lot of investing together, a lot of private equity stuff. And, uh, he's one of the probably top guys in the nation, maybe the world in the wave parks. And so they're opening one in Myrtle beach. Right yeah. Now. That's where Drew's from. Yeah. So that's like the flagship one they're opening right now. Uh, we have one in, uh, in Vegas that I'm invested in. Um, so I do buy other things besides Bitcoin. Uh, uh, and I like to invest with my passion. So we're, I've been investing in these surf, these surf parks. Uh, but though, those are like below Waco away, right? You get like, like Slater's wave park, right? You get like head high waves, 15, 15, 20 turns, right? Like insane. Yeah. No, that'd be perfect to Myrtle too. Cause Myrtle's, I grew up surfing down there when we lived in South Carolina as well. Myrtle's like and, a, I think it's a top three or maybe a top five destination in the U S yeah. It's got the most, uh, golf courses, uh, like, per square mile in yeah. the US. So we'll probably, within the next 24 months, we should probably have maybe six to eight wave parks open in the US. That's incredible. They're gonna be insane, like yeah. really good. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've never done the wave park yet, but I need to get, we need to go to Waco. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it for sure. Yeah. Once on, once my hip recovers. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? How long is that gonna take? Uh, I mean, dude, like. You're not gimping around for somebody who just got a hip. I, I'm, I'm gimping a little bit. They basically, they, they take the whole joint out they cut your bone off. They put a fake ball on. They they put a new cup in and like a new ball joint on a car and like, you're good to go. Like ball joints don't need time to break in. Like your hip doesn't need time to break in. Like he said, go for it. He said, uh, he said, don't, don't jump. Give it a couple months before you're like really impacting it. But other than that, like start doing squats, do yoga, whatever you want to do. So kind of at my own comfort. Yeah. So I'm two weeks in right now and I'm getting around pretty good. So I think within the next four weeks, I should be back on the water. I'm Hell yeah. I'm back on the dirt bike in a couple months. How'd you slam yourself? <sighs> it's that dirt bike, man. <laughs> um, just, just, uh, it's, you know, I grew up, I grew up uh, racing dirt bikes. I, I started an e-commerce business in 2001. So dot com boom, I was investing through that, like out of high school, like my roommate quit his job. We're like day trading these crazy things called internet stocks. It was very similar to what this crypto boom has kind of been about. Mm -hmm. We're talking about these crypto thi or in internet things, internet things, right? Dot com boom. And then uh, in 1999, um, a buddy and I, we started this dot com business and we were going to get filthy rich. And it was because uh, everything with the dot com back then was just getting crazy funding. And um, and uh, it was a it was a website where you could go and shop and you could get rewards back and you can give them to a charity of your choice, which we have thousands of those today. But in 1999, there was none of them. And man, we had, there was no servers. There's no Amazon web services, none of that. We had to actually build a server rack in my office. We had to host it ourselves, right? Hot swappable RAID 5 drives, all this stuff. And then like, right as we launched it, then psh, the, dot, the, dot, <laughs> the dot bomb, right? And then so in 2001, I had this great idea. I was, I grew up racing motocross and stuff. I was like, ah, I'll start this uh, e-commerce business. I'll sell motocross products online. And uh, there was no Shopify, none of that. I, I spent like 25 grand to like build this e-commerce store. And I went to these companies. I said, hey, I want to sell your products on my website. And they laughed at me. They said, no one would ever buy anything online. That was ridiculous. I was like, well, I, I beg to differ. And I built this website. Like, can I just buy your products? They said, we don't even want our products sold on the internet. What? That's how it was. Like, that's what I lived through, right? So anyway, uh, I've been doing motocross for a long time. Back to that story. So um, I built that up, um, had a Fortune 500 exit on that. Built it up into the largest e-commerce business, you know, at the time, which was pretty cool. So I've been riding motocross a long time and I've paid the price. I used to get really crazy and we would be out in the hills, like shoveling jumps and like, how big do you think that gap is? I don't know, hundred feet. You think we can make it? What gear? Third gear, fourth gear. Uh, who's going to go first? <laughs> <laughs> and like a uh, hundred foot, 150 foot jumps, like crazy, right? Racing all that. I've gotten much more mellow as I've gotten older, but like, so anyway, uh, it was not a bad crash. It shouldn't have been, but I just came over a hill and there was like this big rain rut. I went into the rain rut. I got thrown over the bars. And I jammed my femur into my hip socket so hard like this oh. that it, your, your hip, your, your, your hip socket, or the ball should be a ball. So it's, it rolls smoothly. And I put a dent in the bone. And so it's no longer round. Right. And then it dislocated and just ripped the whole socket. Oh. Apart. And so for two years, I've been trying to like heal it. I didn't want to do the surgery. And then finally I just had to throw in the towel. How'd you get dragged out of there? 
I got back on my bike and rode it out. Oh, you did? Yeah. yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I remember I was laying there in pain and um, my buddy helped me up. And as soon as I stood up, I heard it go, <laughs> like oh. it popped back into socket and he heard it too. And like the pain kind of went away and I got back on the bike and rode out and I never had surgery. I mean, I just, I kind of just rode it out, you know, but after two years I had to get it taken care of. Yeah. That's no, crazy when you do quote unquote extreme sports, like surfing. I grew up skating a lot surfing i did some dirt biking as well but the pain tolerance that you develop over all that is is pretty insane yeah i broke my back surfing in the water oh. that was super scary probably one of the closest times i've ever come to dying um surfing super heavy waves down in mexico i have a wave runner so we go chase like super big waves down just south of the border and uh i was getting away you know whole session like waves higher than the ceiling right but like 10 foot wide big old barrels mm -hmm. And I, the only time I got in trouble, I ditched my board and I swam under. And as the wave came up, it sucked me off the bottom over the falls and, over the sl lip. and slammed me into the sand. And the whole wave crushed me, uh. broke, broke my back, ripped my board off. I felt like electricity shoot through my legs. Um, knocked the wind out of me, obviously, right? Like I had not expected that. Just total shock, gnarly pain, knocked the wind out of me. I can't move my legs and now my board's gone. I have nothing to float on and I barely get to the surface. And if you had the wind knocked out of you before, like <laughs> you think you're gonna die anyway, right? Yeah. Well, here I am in the water and I barely get to the surface just in time to see another one about to crash on my head. Oh. And like, I went under that, somehow came to the surface again, but now I got sucked all the way to the outside. So now I'm way on the outside with these gnarly waves and I have no board, nothing to float on my legs. I can't, I can't breathe. Dude, that was insane. Nobody was out. We're in Mexico. There's nobody around. Did you have a Did you have a wave runner come get you? I had a couple buddies, and uh, everyone had gone in. We were on our way in, and uh, one of my buddies was way down the beach, and um, he saw me like barely signaling, and he came over. He's like, "Are you okay? Are you okay?" I'm like, "No, I'm not. Like, I'm gonna die." Uh, <laughs> laid on his board for a little bit. We didn't have the wave runner in the water that day, unfortunately. Actually, that's the session that got me to go buy the wave runner. <laughs> that's when I, I bought the wave runner. After that. So anyway, I got on his board and I laid there and, and we waited until there was like a lull in the waves. And he's like, all right, like start paddling. And I, my, my arms worked okay. So I was like paddling, paddling, paddling. Here comes another set. He's like, dude, ditch the board. You got, you got to ditch the board. I'm like, hell no, I ain't ditching this board. He's like, dude, you got to ditch the board. I'm like, I ain't ditching this board. And I just freaking grabbed that thing like a bear hug and <laughs> just did that thing just hit me and just rode me in. So anyway, yeah, I've... Uh, Spent four months in Puerto Escondido surfing that Mexican pipeline. Uh, I've spent m multiple winters on the North Shore doing that thing in the winter. Oh man, you can get you can get wrecked pretty hard. Yeah, I mean my my closest to death in the water happened in Jersey, and then in Costa Rica and Haka, Playa. Those waves get gnarly there Playa for sure. Hermosa. Yeah. Playa Hermosa, that beach break. Whew. Yeah, vicious. Yeah, it's like it was like both instances. Jersey was like Hurricane Dennis, I believe, in 2009. And we had like 20 foot waves. And I was riding like a 9 0 longboard, just like meathead surfer, like caught a wave. I was like, ah, oh, this is the last one, caught it, rode it. I was like, I need another. Going out, <clears throat> paddling out, you get back in the lineup. And my arms were just rubber, and like a, a monster set came in. I yeah. was like trying to get over. <laughs> Got taken over the fall, like board was on top of me. Yeah. Got like knocked under, driven under. I think I was under for like 30, 40 seconds, which feels like five minutes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Came up, was like, holy fuck. I'm yeah. Going in. I've done a lot of breath work, right? So like when you surf in big waves, you have to be prepared for that, right? So like I've done like Wim Hof stuff and like just like deep, deep stuff. And like, you know, in a controlled environment, I could hold my breath for three minutes, mm -hmm. like still on a bed or like in a swimming pool, but dude, you're down for 10 seconds under a wave and like you think it's an eternity, yeah. right? Well, that's like the, it is a mental thing too. You have to train yourself, like prepare to, calm, yeah. to know that you're gonna go under and you're gonna be in a, a washing machine and just like let your body ragdoll and try to, yeah. try to not get too excited. So it's, so it's awesome for that. And also like, um, you know, surfing specifically, um, you surf big waves and like, sometimes you're trying to get out and it's like impossible and, it's, and you want to give up. How many times have you just like, screw it, I'll just turn back to the beach and yeah. just go in, but you don't yeah. you fight through. So amazing life lessons, right? And uh, to perseverance, to push through. It's the hardest, it's the hardest thing in the world. Any sport in the world, right? Surfing yeah. is like insane. So 
you're fighting mother nature. Like you're fighting mother nature. But like you said, you, you're skateboarding. Like, you know, I grew up skateboarding, snowboarding, right? I can go snowboarding. I could ride for six hours. Easy. Uh, if I get really good, I've been surfing most of my life and, uh, on like a really good wave, maybe I ride for 20 seconds and on a really good session, I get six of those. So yeah. it's like a minute, minute and a half of ride time in one day, a minute and a half versus like six hours of ride time on a snowboard. So it's like, and then, and then the snowboard or a skateboard, like it's the same, same jump or same hit, same curb every time, but on a wave, it's constantly changing all the time. Yeah. That's, That's but there's nothing better when you're riding the line. You just got the wall water, and you can. And surfing is the only sport you have to compete just to do it, right? So anyone can hop on a snowboard, jump off the lift, hit the jump, or on your skateboard, <laughs> go hit the pipe or the quarter pipe, the curb, whatever. But surfing, especially where I'm at in Southern California, tr Lower Trestles, one of the best waves in the world, most competitive waves in the world. Now we have. Felipe Toledo, Mick Fanning, Kelly Slater, Gabriel Medina, uh, and then the San Clemente crew, Griffin Colapinto, Chloe, like all the world champions live there. Yeah. It's the, mo now, now parents are moving there just so their kids can grow up there. You get 75 guys in the water, like the best surfers in the world. And there's one wave coming. It's the ultimate alpha sport. Yeah. So I'm out there. I ain't no world champion, but like I grew up. So then you have like these different hierarchies. Yes. So like I grew up there. I've been there longer. My kids grew up there, go to school there, represent the town, right? So then it's a hierarchy. And then you have hierarchies on like your skill level. So if you're like, you're really good or how long you've been there. Right? And so there's like this di different hierarchies, but you got 60, 70 guys in the water and there's one wave. Who's going to get that wave, right? And you got to fight. There's, so then you have the hierarchy, then you have the positioning and you got all that, like the courtesy of like who's inside. You got all like, that. Right. And so, uh, so anyway, okay. you have to fight to do it and who's going to get that wave. And, and, that, and then you have like all these weather things. Right. So an interesting parallel to like Bitcoin, right. Where it's like, you have all these, uh, variables. So like, you have to make sure the swell is good. Um, the, the waves coming in this, the right direction, the tide has to be right. The wind has to be right. The crowds hopefully have to be right. And then you have to get that wave. You have to beat everybody. But when you get that, it's so scarce <laughs> that it's the sweetest thing in the world. It feels so good. Because it's because of the scarcity. Yeah. Right? I'll go snowboarding and after a couple hours, like oh, I'm done. Right. But surfing, it's like so rare to get that wave. It's so scarce that it's, that it's precious. Yeah. And then you have everybody like, fuck, I wish I had that wave. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Now in South Jersey too, when the waves do come, and that, that hierarchy is interesting because you have the people who live down in that area year round. And then what many would consider me is uh, somebody comes in, just hangs out in the summer. So you have like the, the locals and the schlocals. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, and then you have that hierarchy. Which is like, uh, I've been fine. This is my beach. Yeah. Yeah. It used to be a lot different. Like when I was a kid growing up, the, the elders were like, like you didn't, you didn't step out of line. Like the elders would break your board. They'd grab you, they'd dunk you, they'd do whatever. Right. Um, and, uh, today the problem that we have, and you see it all over the world, right? Like, uh, especially with COVID, like people now say all kinds of things that like, they just wouldn't say when I was a kid, like you would get smacked. Yeah. And so today these kids in the water, they have no respect and we can't really regulate properly. Like we, when I was a kid, I got regulated. You can't do that anymore because now all the parents are there with their cameras and their film and they're calling the police on a regular basis. And these kids have grown up with like really no one like uh, disciplining them. You know what I mean? And it's, it's created, it's, it's created a lot of chaos. Yeah. Right? The TikTok generation and the waves. I can't the, imagine them. The TikTok generation and the waves. And it's just, just no respect, right? And there's no consequence, right? Uh, the fiat money system has taken all consequence <laughs> out of everything, right? So the corporations are too big to fail. Um, kids in high school, they they, in California, the kids, the kid, the, the teachers can't even send the kids to the principal's office. What? It, it might make them feel bad. <laughs> no, no joke. When I was a kid, the principal would actually smack you. Oh, right. I went to Catholic school. We had nuns that would smack us. Right. So you'd actually get spanked by the principal today. They can't even send them to the principal's office because they might feel bad about themselves. So what do you think happens? Right. Some of these kids grow up, no responsibility. They're saying all kinds of things that used to just get smacked in the face or, or in the water, you'd get dunked or whatever, told to go home or break your board, whatever. And so you would learn respect yeah. one way or another, but yeah, no respect anymore. It's crazy. That's one thing as a father with two young sons now, it's like acknowledging that reality and the culture around kids in the internet age. It's like how, I mean, you're two and a half now. You, 
you barely know what's going on, but when you turn 13, 14, like how do I yeah. make sure that you, you have respect? Well, that's your job. Yeah. That's your job, right? That's why the family unit's so important, right? And kids really need the dad and the mother, right? The mother gives them a little, you know, different than what the father gives them. But um, the father's got to definitely teach that part. Yeah. If, if you're a good father. Uh, some, some words of wisdom. So my kids are older. A mm -hmm. um, couple things. One, someone told me that super, super, that stuck with me the whole time is that you had your chance. Now it's theirs. Mm -hmm. But I always think about that. Two, if I could go back and have a do-over with my kids, which I can't, so I'll tell you instead. If I could go back and have a do-over, I would have disciplined way more. Yeah. Like way harder. Yeah. Way harder. Uh, way more. Um, spoil the rod, spoil the, uh, spare the rod, spoil the child, right? So um, they, my kids needed more discipline. And then um, three, part of the discipline piece is um, they should have been working way sooner. They got to work immediately. When, as soon as they're old enough, they got to be working around the house, pick up their toys, clean up the room, do the dishes, go, go mow the yard, you know, those kinds of things. That, and, and I wasn't good about that. That, you know, the, the fourth turning, the generational theory, mm -hmm. like my grandfather lived on a farm. My father grew up on a farm, but left the farm. I'm a hard worker because my father, but I, I never want to do dirty work. And now my kids, the fourth generation, like can't even freaking clean up the table. <laughs> <laughs> so those are some things I would do differently for sure. Yeah. No, that was one thing my dad was really good about when I was 12. I mean, he had me on the beach walking, selling papers. And then Me too. Yeah. But I haven't done a good job. I don't feel like, and of course I'm always trying to, I'm, a, I'm always trying to get better and better and better. Uh, and I did the same thing. I had lawn mowing routes. My parents made me sell stuff in front of the house, like all that. But I just, I wasn't good at pushing that back down. Yeah. So I, if I could, if I could get a do over, I would do better at that. Yeah. That was, that's the one thing. In my broader family, we all, my extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, we all go to the same shore town across like the 50 of us. That's like the one thing. It's like, all right, if you're going to be here in the summer, you have to work. It's not like, yeah, good. You can't just like hang on the Pass it down, day. man. Pass yeah. it down. Yeah. No, it's important. Like walking the beach, selling papers. And I worked at a hot dog stand for eight summers after that summer. Um, and that was like really interesting because you're literally on the edge of the beach working 11 to four, which are like the prime beach hours. And you just have to watch everybody go and come back. And you're, you're at the edge of the beach working hard. And yeah, a lot of, a lot of good lessons. It was a good, uh, no, I'll never forget too. Like part of that job, I got to take a surfing break. Um, so I'd bring my board to the cart and one day, I, the waves were really good and I just lost track of time and I was out in the water for like an hour and a half when I had an hour break and I came back and I was busy and my boss was like, what the fuck? <laughs> he taught me a lesson. I went and bought a watch that day. So yeah. like when I was in the water the next time, I knew what time it was when I had to get out. Yeah. Like, it's, uh, but look how, look at the work ethic that you have today over that, right? Yeah. So like now you're self-motivated, you're self-driven, you're doing these things right here. Like you got this cool studio built out, um, but that's all because of, of where you came from. Yeah. Back to that generational theory. And so I knew it, man. I knew it. I could see it. I, I get this stuff, man. I study it. I teach it. But living it's harder, man. It's it harder, you know? And I, and I think back to my kids and like, what could I have done different, you know? And a lot of it was um, because I wanted so much stuff when I was a kid that I didn't get. Like, dude, my dream was just, could we go to Disneyland? Like, I just, like, it was a lot different when I grew up. Um, we just, you know, people were in extract. We didn't have this big fiat money system. And so like, um, it was even middle, even, even middle class or upper class families, you had like one pair of shoes and just like two pairs of jeans. That's just how it was back then. Right. We didn't have all this, um, opulence that we have today. Um, at the end of an empire, right. You have the extravagance is one of the last sections before the empire collapses. And so we're kind of in that extravagance. Um, but like, I want, I want to travel all over the world and surf. So my kids are like, dad, we don't want to go back to Hawaii again. That's like what my kids, that's what, that's how my kids are. Right. And like, they're getting custom boards and custom what Cause I want them to go surf with me. Like we're taking back country trips, snowboarding to Canada and I'm, they got the best gear because I want them to go with me and I want to do it. So I've spoiled the crap out of them. Not because I wanted to spoil them, but because I wanted that, I wanted, I want to do that as a family kind of a thing. Um, so I, I couldn't really take that back, but but uh, definitely could have made them work harder and I could have disciplined them a little bit more. I mean, they're good kids. I hate, I hate to, I don't want to paint them in a bad light, uh, but just, you know, in hindsight, what I could have tweaked a little bit. Yeah. That's one thing me and my wife talk about. Like one job our kids are definitely going to have is working in the restaurant industry because that teaches you 
um, how to deal with customers and face to face. Well, that, but like more importantly, when you're on the other side, um, later in life, when you're going and you're going to good restaurants and right, how you know, to treat people. Yeah, how to treat the server. Like I hate when people treat servers like shit. It's yeah, like, um, yeah. In high school, I worked at a bar down the street um, from school and leave school, walk to the bar. Shout out McCrossins in Philadelphia. Um, I, I never did. I uh, I never worked. I never. I, well. My dad was a, is a con construction contractor, flooring contractor, the worst. And since I was nine years old, I had to work with him doing construction. I hated it. I was like slave labor, pay me a dollar an hour. Um, but I never had any of those types of jobs. When I was 18 years old, I graduated high school. High school, I started buying bank-owned repos from the bank, fixing them and flipping them. Damn. And I was freaking on my way. What drove you to do that that young? I think because my dad made me make money since I was a kid. Yeah. So... The, I, the thought of like, I should go get a job's never crossed my mind ever once. It's always, how can I make money? Yeah. That's like the thought process, right? So it was like, how can I make money? Well, I can go sell candy bars in front of the house when I'm a kid. I can go mow lawns and I guess I can buy and sell real estate and whatever. Obviously, how did I get that idea? So um, you don't know what you don't know, right? So you have to, um, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a disciple of Robert Kiyosaki, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I read that book. It really shifted my life. Now he's one of my good friends. We're doing a lot of work together. Um, we're about to do a three-part educational series on where I'm going to really dive in, into this cash flow quadrant that he broke down. So we're starting to do stuff together. But anyway, um, he talks about um, you have a cup and like the, you can fill up the content of the cup. But what you really need is you need a bigger cup more context. So anyway, you don't know what you don't know. Luckily for me, your, your network is your net worth. My best friend and my roommate, his grandfather owned a, a big bank savings and loans and they had like a private money lender and they had been, he had been helping this like Mexican kid who barely spoke English in South Central LA um, buy these bank on repos and fix them and flip them. And the guy became a multimillionaire. And so his, my, my buddy's grandfather's like, Hey, take my grandson and teach, teach him the ropes. So he did. So my, my roommate, my best friend was now doing this with this Mexican kid and they were making a bunch of money. And, uh, I saw it and I was like, okay, I'll do the same thing. They didn't help me. I didn't get the benefit of the coaching, but just seeing it and knowing that it was available or was possible. Mm -hmm. Someone broke the four minute mile. I knew I could break the four minute mile. Right. So I saw them do it. So I was like, all right, I'll do the same thing. And at the time in California, uh, we had just come out of this, uh, the only really real estate crash that we had had in history. They started measuring uh, real estate in like 1960s. So from 89 to 92, there was this massive crash. So I got started in 1995 and the banks had so many bank repos that they had given them away, zero down. Just take them, zero down. I had to come up with $3,000 for closing costs. My first property was an $80,000 duplex. I needed $3,000 for closing costs, which I didn't even have. I was 18. I didn't have, eight, I didn't have three grand. So I took on a partner. <laughs> we split that. We got some credit cards. We did most of the work ourselves. And uh, I made 30 grand. Holy shit. On the first deal. And at that time, that was a good amount of money. Dude, hell yeah. That was good money. In 1995, I was, you know, just out, just young out of high school. And so I just parlayed to the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. Within a decade, I'm sitting on over $25 million in real estate. Holy shit. I didn't even know what I was doing. You know, hundreds of, hundreds of uh, flip, fix and flips, hundreds of units, rentals, and just jumped right into the deep end, man. Yeah. And to pe like, that's the, like, it's interesting because I came out of high school. I did some, I mowed a lot of lawns too. Like growing up, like I was like in our, <laughs> in yeah, our neighborhood, I was the guy walking around with the lawnmower. Um, and then went to college, studied economics, worked at a fund. And then like, early twenties post college until I turned like 27. I was just like trying to work a job for somebody else. And, and, and at the time I didn't recognize it, but like there was something like viscerally in my body where I was like, I cannot work for somebody. Um, and it wasn't until I started the newsletter of the podcast where it's like, Oh, this is what I need to do. I need to work for myself. Yeah. It's uh, I tell my wife, I've always been unemployed, you know, and she's like, come on, you have been, I've, I've had multiple, I've had, eight businesses now that have reached seven or eight figures within, within a year. So I'm kind of like a growth hacker. I've had 65 people working on it. At one point I was the largest, I did lead generation. So I've been like an online marketer. I did lead generation. We were the largest solar lead generator in the United States. I had over a hundred people working on the floor. So I've had big businesses. I just never had a job, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, I mean, you, you have a job, but you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, never, I never filled out a job application and went and like worked for somebody. Yeah. That's one thing you just mentioned that we're really trying to apply here is getting smarter on like growth hacking. 
as we've said, just running the newsletter on the podcast and just using word of mouth for the first five years. And like in the last six months, we've decided to like implement a growth strategy to get it out there and like actually like try to grow this, make it like much bigger than it is right now. Yeah. So your career started working uh, in the finance industry and you learned a lot about economics that way. Mm -hmm. I did, I had to find it the unfortunate hard way. <laughs> so I just started making money and, uh, you know, rising tide rises all boats kind of a thing, I guess. Maybe I was uh, fortunate of uh, perfect timing, whatever. But, you know, from 95 to 2005 was like, shh, right? Uh, but when 2008 came, I mean, my, when the tide went out, man, I was swimming naked. Yeah. And uh, I got friggin' smashed. And I had just... Um, you know, I was building houses and, uh, I was building, we, we were doing everything in like South Central Compton Watts. And this was, I'm older than you, you, you may remember, but this was the height of, uh, when NWA came out mm -hmm. and this was when the Rodney King riots happened in LA and the OJ trial and like, dude, like the, the, the gangs and everything was gnarly in South Central. And I was, that's where I was working in the hood, <laughs> like no joke. And me and my buddies were just a couple of white boys hanging out in the hood with the gangsters. And, uh, and, uh, we almost died. Uh, so we were doing, we did, we did them all. We, we'd go to the biggest gangster in the street and be like, Hey buddy, um, I'm going to give you, since I'm in your hood, I'm going to give you five grand when I finish this property, just because it's your, your neighborhood. But if anything happens to this house, if, if they steal our copper pipes, if they steal our windows, that comes out of the 5,000 that we're going to give to you. And then they would watch over that place. Yeah. And they were good. You know, they would, um, you know, I remember the Rodney King trial and they said, uh, Hey, don't come to LA tomorrow. I'm like what? He's like, don't, don't come. Like we're going to wild out. You don't want to be here. <laughs> so like it was, it was helpful. But one time well, we would buy these bank on repos and we'd have to go get the people out of the house. Oh shit. So we'd have to be part of the eviction and we're like white boys going into the gangsters and saying, you got to leave your house. And we, you know, obviously super nice. Hey, here's a couple thousand bucks, you know, go get a new place. Here's the money, like super helpful. And these one people, they just wouldn't leave, man. And we kept going back and they wouldn't leave. Finally, they said, don't ever come back here again. We're like, okay. So we start leaving and they started chasing us and we're trying to get on the freeway and they're trying to like block us off so we can't even get away. And at that point, we're like, all right, we're done. This is a car? Yeah, in the car. And we're like, all right, we're never going back to South Central again. I started building stuff down in South Orange County, multi-million dollar properties. Um, I'm like, I'm done with the hood. So we started doing multi-million dollar properties. Um, the first one I did right on the beach, three houses off the beach. We bought it for like 750,000, ended up flipping it for like 1.5 million. I'm like, oh, that's way better than $100,000 <laughs> houses. Um, and we started doing multifamily, mixed use, whatever. Uh, I had built this sick custom house, elevator, six car garage, whitewater view, just got married, just had my first kid. And uh, I sold, I had two different businesses, the medical equipment business, I had the e-commerce business, sold both of those. I was done, man. I was 30 years old, done, like on top of it. I was the smartest guy in the world. And then boom, boom just friggin' smacked in the face as Mike Tyson would say, right? You have a plan to get smacked in the face. And so then I was like, well, shoot, man, what the hell happened? Like, dude, I got to sell my house. I got to move out. I, I don't know how I'm going to pay. F I don't know how I'm going to live. Like I, how, I got a kid. Like, what am I even going to do? Like, I have no income. I got nothing. And um, I was like, man, I'm really good. I had done really good at making money, but what the hell is this financial casino that's going on that has control and power over my life? And I don't know anything about it. I'm not even watching it. Like, what is that? And so I got into it more out of necessity. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I, like, I was like, you know, I grew up doing sports. I'm pretty, pretty competitive, right? Um, I learned a concept that money's like energy. It doesn't disappear, it transfers. So when I lost my money, someone else got it. Mm -hmm. I didn't like that. So I, I vowed to myself, I vowed to my wife, my family, that this will never happen ever again. I'll be on the receiving end of these wealth transfers from now on. And I basically spent the last 12, 13 years studying the Federal Reserve, studying macroeconomics, <laughs> geopolitics to stay one step ahead. Um, so I got into it uh, out of necessity. You, you, you got the easy way. I got the hard way. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, because around that time I was in high school and I, it was serendipitous where you know, I was a senior in high school, fall of 2008. And I took an, a, an elective economics course and the world was going to shit. And I was radicalized as a 17 year old in that classroom because yeah. luckily the teacher I had was on top of things and he had us going through the TARP bill and um, 
like diving into. How how crazy was that TARP bill? So for everybody that doesn't know, it was the it was the troubled asset relief program, right? They bailed out the banks. So I was in real estate. It was a real estate crash, right? The real estate um, crash brought the entire global financial system down. And in order to save the global financial system, they had to do this troubled asset relief program. The TARP program was seven hundred billion at the time, which was like unfathomable. And it was like you can't do that. No way. 700 billion. And today we're just throwing trillies around like they're nothing. <laughs> Another trilly, 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 right? <laughs> 700 billion to save the whole global system. Yeah. And you go into the TARP bill. That's the thing that radicalized me. There was so, so much shit attached yeah. to it where you have politicians just getting things that they want in their localities snuck into the bill. It's like if we're in dire economic straits, why does anybody care the type of arrow that you can shoot in Kansas or something yeah. like that? So they, they, it was 700 billion. They ended up spending, uh, the Fed ended up doing it about another 700 billion. So it's about 1.5 trillion was like the total bailout package. Um, last year, um, through the FOIA Freedom of Information Request Act, Freedom of Information Act, the FOIA request, um, they had been trying to get the Fed to release the info on really how much stimulus they had put into the market. And of course the Fed fought it, fought it, fought it for over, for over a decade. And it was finally released last year. And we found out it wasn't the 700 billion or the 1.5 trillion that we knew about. It was over $20 trillion. What? I didn't hear this. Yeah. Over $20 trillion that the Fed ended up pumping into this. Insane. How did they do that? Uh, through all their SPVs, you know, special purpose vehicles and, you know, all these backdoor things. Um, so yeah, 20 trillion, no big deal, right? Another 20 trillion were lost in Afghanistan in the last decade. It's 40 trillion. Um, we know um, when, in 2019, when the, when the banking system froze up, the reverse repo rate, the overnight repo rate, um, the Fed started injecting liquidity. It was like 50 billion a night, then 75 billion, 100 billion. It got up to a, a trillion a day. So from September 2019 till July 2020, they pumped in another 11 trillion. That's 20 trillion, 20 trillion, 11 trillion. That's you know, $50 trillion in a decade. Yeah. It's uh, no big deal. So I guess where you, I mean, you mentioned like the cycles that we're in, like where, like, are we at a point right now where 50 years from, from now, historians will look back and say, hey, America yeah. had fallen, the empire had fallen like in 2008 and we just don't recognize it yet. That's exactly right. So we don't know, uh, nobody can pick the top or bottom of a market. We don't know until we look backwards on it. And we don't know the top or bottom of a society until we look backwards on it. So the Roman Empire, historians say this is the date the Roman Empire fell. But when they were living through the Roman Empire, they didn't know it had yeah, fallen. They say like 464 AD. Yeah. Like. So that's kind of what you're saying. And, and uh, to, to the point you made, and this is something I say all the time, like we're living through a period that history books will study. Uh, like we study the Weimar inflation, mm -hmm. like they're going to study this period. It's going to be the biggest anomaly that's ever been seen in history. And I, I think that people are going to look back and go, what the hell were they thinking? Yeah. Because we're, we're really, we're 50 years into this monetary experiment. Really? I mean, it started probably with the Bank of England back in the late 1600s, but maybe then accelerated with the Federal Reserve creation in 1913. But really we're 50 years into a fiat money system. So like 50 a, years, it's an anomaly. Like a completely untethered, just pump money into the system as much as you can. Yeah. And look at the mess that we've made, right? Yeah. And so let's talk about what you were describing to me last night, the concept of devolution to get revolution. Yeah. Does that play into this at all? Yeah, it certainly does. So because um, necessity is the mother of invention or whatever, right? So because I had that huge economic pain and I was like, okay, this is never going to happen again. So basically, like I said, my, my life's work now has been studying these wealth transfer effects and how they work. And so there's multiple times, multiple ways they happen obviously through new technologies, technological revolutions, they happen. Um, they happen through massive uh, crashes, you know, financial crashes. Um, they happen with uh, demographic changes. So there's different things that, that cause them. So I've, I've really studied this a lot. Um, one of the things is that we can see that we have these cycles. So you kind of talked about that. Um, at BitBlock Boom last year, I gave a presentation. It was a short version of, of these three revolutionary cycles that are converging. So it's a 250 year political revolution cycle, an 80 year financial revolution cycle, and a 50 year technological revolution cycle. So there are three different cycles all on different timeframes, but they're all happening right now, which is pretty interesting, um, which kind of tells us how we got here and explains why the world's so friggin' crazy right now. Um, but then where does it go? Right. So then obviously we want to use history to know where we go in the future so we can better be equipped and, and positioned for that. Right. Like um, history tells us if I touch, if I touch that hot stove and I burn my hand, that's history. Well, I would know if I touch something hot again, I'll probably burn my, 
self again, right? That's like history. So it's important to understand that. Um, they want to get rid of history, but it's super important. But yeah, for the de-evolution. So for the last 250 years, like a pendulum swinging, right? And so for the last 250 years, we've been, the pendulum has been swinging from a decentralized world to a centralized world. And then the pendulum will swing back to a decentralized world. So um, in markets, you have like what's called like a long-term secular market. Mm -hmm. And then within that long-term secular trend, you can have cyclical smaller markets. So from 2008 till today, we've been in a long-term secular bull market. The market's always gone up, even though there's been small dips in the S&P 500, 20% dips, five of them, I think, three, three, three or four of them. Um, those are cyclical dips, but it's a long-term secular trend. And so the long-term secular trend for the last 250 years has been globalization. It's been monetary expansion. Um, and it's been, uh, oh, population growth, mm -hmm. right? And so um, as you get more people trying more things, solving more problems, you get more progress. Um, as the monetary supply expands, you get booms. Um, and, as the po and, um, and as globalization happened, we got more people in the world trying more things. We've been able to offshore. Uh, really, we saw the rise of the technical worker so we got, you know, through Asia, Pakistan, India, we've got, you know, more web programmers and coders and like stuff than we could ever imagine engineers and we could have doctors and we could ever imagine. So we got the rise of this technical worker it became a commodity. And so as that's happened over the last 250 years, it's been this massive um, evolution, if you will, right? The world's seen the greatest period of progress ever. But the problem is, is that we've kind of maxed out. I think the long-term secular trend is shifting to go the opposite direction. And so... Um, a couple things that happened are the catalyst of that. You know, markets, um, again, we don't know when markets peaked till we look backwards, but markets stop going up when there's no more buyers, right? So like when Bitcoin peaked in 2017, it sucked everybody in, everybody in. It was going from, a, it went from a thousand to 20,000 and it sucked more people in or like the real estate market in, you know, 2007. Everyone's getting rich. Everyone's buying, buy, 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 buy. But eventually like there's no one left to buy and then it gets super volatile and it kind of has like blow off top. And so that's kind of where we're at. We've kind of maxed out this long-term cycle. And uh, again, history shows us this. And I think the de-evolution piece is, is important. There's a couple of things that happened, um, but ultimately the real death blow is the loss of trust. Yes. And that, that's, that just can't be understated. That's like the number one change or piece of catalyst, I think. Yeah. And that's something we talk about on this show a lot is many people think of hyperinflation a simply mechanical printing more monetary units and debasing the currency overall, but there's two parts to it, that mechanical expansion of the monetary base and then the confidence in that unit of currency. Yeah, I think we're beginning to see the facade of that confidence erode very rapidly. I, I think it's, I think it, I think it, it's dead. Yeah. And so I think we saw it being eroded, but I, uh, the confidence in the unit because they're constantly manipulating and increasing it, that, that's one thing, but I think it's it's even bigger than that. And um, it's that when the truckers protested in Canada, Canada just froze their bank accounts. And all of a sudden it was like, Jordan Peterson went on the news or on social media and said, hey, everyone pull your money out of the banks. And you got this like bank run in Canada and they quickly reversed that decision. But everybody just, the whole world just realized, shoot, the money in the bank isn't safe. But that was individuals. But then when the Russia-Ukraine situation escalated, the Russian bank reserves, the FX reserve got seized, frozen. And it wasn't just dollars. They, they actually had been de-dollarizing for over a decade, right? So they had their FX reserves in multiple currencies, but they all got frozen. And so there's three global superpowers in the world with nuclear weapons, China, Russia, and the US. And if it can happen to one of the three global superpowers with nukes, what chance does a tier two or tier three nation have? Yeah. Zero. Zero. And so we saw, I mean, just, just since the Biden administration has been in office, they seized um, the $8 billion in the Afghanistan Central Bank. Eh, we'll just take that. So that's not good. Venezuela is like, well, we'll just hold gold, but we obviously, we still need global trade. So we'll keep our gold in the London vaults. And so London just seized $2 billion of Venezuela's gold. Eh, we'll just take that. <laughs> <laughs> So that's like trust is gone. Yeah. And so now because trust evaporated, now everything's falling apart. Let me let me let me give you like an analogy. And there's more here too. You go to Lebanon, you go to Turkey, like Yeah. Like internally it's not even external forces taking their money. They can't manage their money. People in Lebanon just woke up one day and their savings completely wiped out. Yeah. So like uh, if, if since you're married, we're both married, um, a business partner, I mean, any type of relationship you have, but like, let's say you're married, right? And 
<laughs> you're starting to suspect your wife may be doing something or your business partner. You're, you're starting to scrutinize every expense your business partner puts in. You think he's embezzling or your wife's like texting late at night, right? And uh, you're starting to like have these doubts. So then you're already starting to change your behavior, right? And you're starting to be cautious and guarding stuff. But then at some point you find that information. You see that your partner embezzled. You see your wife cheated. Trust is gone, right? And it most likely is okay. not coming back. In, in the case of a business partner, like no way. Some, some marriages can reconcile, but I don't know if that trust ever really comes back, right? So most likely it ends up in, in divorce. And then what happens? Um, let's divvy up the assets. Let's fight over who gets what. We're gonna go through this long divorce for a year and fight over the kids and fight over the house and fight over the cars. And that's kind of where we're at, right? So like uh, trust got killed. And now we've had this, this secular trend of globalization based off of trust. Global shipping lanes are open. We trust that countries won't hijack our shipments. We trust that they'll deliver the money, but all that's gone. So now we're left to fight over divvying up the world. <laughs> divvying up the world, it seems like such a daunting task. It's a, it's a big task, right? Yeah. And so like that trust isn't gonna come back. Not, not anytime, anytime soon. soon. Not anytime soon, right? I might, I might get married again and I'll probably be skeptical at <clears> first. <throat> it's probably gonna take me a while and maybe I'll get married again. It's probably gonna take a long time to get that trust up, but not with my existing business partner or wife, with a new business partner maybe. And maybe I need, I'll need a new contractor. I'll need something. And this is a key piece. If I, was gonna, if I was gonna get back involved in business with another partner, I'm gonna make sure I have some sort of new piece of technology, some new contract, something in place to make sure that same thing didn't happen again to me. Yeah. Right. And so the only way we're going to get this reestablished is with something new. Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> the inevitability just continues to just get stronger and stronger and stronger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it seems like the only logical solution to this trust problem. Right. I mean, Be, so, so the de evolution piece is that because we really, uh, again, it's, it's a 250 year time frame. We can go all the way back to uh, really the, like the Renaissance age, but really we've had this globalization path and we've had this monetary system. Um, obviously global trade got hard with gold because it's, it's, uh, it fails in the, uh, in the portability aspect of it, right? So then we went into the, uh, a gold note, right? An IOU, a debt-based system. Um, but there was, there was trust in that system. For some reason, that trust has been continually killed, right? So 1913, they printed way too many paper gold certificates. So in 1933, they just seized the gold, <laughs> yeah. right? So I don't know why we still had trust after 1933. Um, then 1971, the, in 1933, the US government seized and defaulted to the people. 1971, they seized and defaulted to the world governments. But yet we still kind of believed in this financial system. Um, but now it's gone, right? And so that was this evolution process. So as the world globalized, as we had global trade, as the monetary system um, it grew up, as the uh, population grew up, we had this massive um, evolution. Things got better, things grew, we got people in space, we have you know Zoom and all these things. Um, but now we're gonna be going backwards because now we're gonna go back to these like small island nation states with no more global trade, probably no more global cooperation, communication, um, and it's gonna go the opposite direction. What? Time scale? do you think that plays out on? Uh, it's already happening right now. Mm -hmm. Again, right? It's like uh, hard to see it happening when you're living through it, right? But, uh, but, it's, but it's happening right now. Um, looking at like cycle theory, um, like I said, there's this fourth turning is, is super popular, right? So it's an 80 year cycle. Um, I like to look at it as like an 84 year cycle really. And so if you're looking at like financial charts, you'll see like triple tops or triple bottoms, right? And so like a double confirmation, but a triple confirmation is even more. And so, um, three times 84 equals 252. So it's like the big cycle is 250 years. Um, but in that like fourth turning, um, that the last 20 year cycle is where all the change happens. Vladimir Lenin said like there's decades, nothing happens and days where decades happen. And so like, I think all this change is happening right now. It's, it's happening very, very quickly. Um, I think 2025 ish, we kind of see things really kind of come to a head. And I think by the end of the decade, we'll kind of know that we've turned the corner and, and made that change. What does turning the corner look like? So I think uh, we're already seeing it, right? So like we have three, three nuclear threats right now, right? Russia, Ukraine, we got Iran, Israel, we got Taiwan and China now. Um, so the world's already breaking apart. Um, you know, what's, whatever's happening with uh, China and Taiwan, we got Pelosi going over there, poking the dragon, <laughs> right? And uh, the, what's interesting is like a couple things. So like, uh, 
Pelosi's over there po poking the dragon. She went to South Korea and they wouldn't even meet with her. Yeah. So we don't want to meet with you. We don't want to meet with you. Why? Well, because they're starting to move their alliance to North Korea and China. Well, not North Korea, but China and China is with North Korea. And so they're kind of having to realign there. So they didn't want to be associated with us. And so like we, we've had this fake fiat monetary system that's driven the world. And now people realize, well, we can't trust that anymore. That's out of steam. That's not going to work anymore. And so that's gone. We need to go back to real hard, tangible things, commodities, oil, gas, energy, really, right? And the things that energy can build. And so oil has been the, you know, the petrodollar and it's been the thing that's driven us for the last 50 years or really hundred years since we discovered it in the United States. But now it's things like microchips, right? And so 70% of the microchips in the United States um, come from Taiwan. Yeah. Right. So who controls those things? And, and then South, um, South Korea takes those microchips and builds the things. So it's like, where do those alliances go? Um, and so I think we're, we're starting to see this shake up really bad. So the U S uh, under this new uh, act, they dedicate what 46 billion to re onshore manufacturing chips in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's going to take several years to get that up and going. And we'll probably several years to get that going. And it's probably take decades before we're up to speed on where Taiwan would be. Yeah, people don't recognize the, expertise needed to actually operate within those foundries. Right. Yeah. We're nowhere close to building microchips like they are. So this is happening right now. So like we're, we're building these plants right <clears throat> now. Uh, a lot of people don't understand, but the Ukraine is uh, strategic for many, many reasons. So Asia, Asia is our manufacturing hub and Russia and over there is our commodities hub. So in Ukraine, they make 60% of the world's um, neon neon gas and we need the neon gas to make the microchips. Mm -hmm. So we get the neon gas from Russia, Ukraine, and then the microchips are made in Asia. And so that's like kind of done for us. Yeah. We're, we're sitting over here naked. We're sitting over here naked. So now we're trying to re onshore as fast as we can. It's going to take a couple of years. So that's kind of why I put these time frames together. Right. So over the next couple of years, like we're going to be cutting ourselves off from that completely and trying to re onshore that here. And um, that's going to be massive growing pains from those types of things. Yeah. What can the average American expect in terms of their life changing? Well, the, one, the one thing that I, I made a video a couple weeks ago um, and I said, um, ask, because everyone's focused on inflation right now. CPI, CPI, CPI. The Fed's now data driven and they're focused on getting CPI down. First of all, measuring consumer prices and calling that inflation is ridiculous, right? Under the Austrian viewpoint, inflation is increasing the monetary supply. Prices going up is just the result of that or the effect of that, right? But we look at consumer prices going up. And so they're saying we're data driven. If we can get inflation to come back down from 9.1 now or at 8.5, hey, congratulations. If we can get down to 5.5, whatever. Prices are still going up just slower. But I said, uh, look, asking if inflation has peaked is the wrong question. That's the wrong question. We are nowhere near peak inflation. I think we might see some of the lowest inflation points we'll see for the decade right now. Yeah. Because uh, we've had this massive deflation by offshoring all these jobs. Take a $50,000 job here, send it out for 8,000 bucks to India. A $100 part here, get it made in China for eight bucks. But now as we onshore all that stuff back again, the prices are gonna go through the roof. So what does the average person expect? Expect higher prices. Now it depends on where you live is part of it. So if, if we're talking to an American audience, definitely expect consumer prices to be going up. If you live over in Europe, <laughs> that's a whole nother question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I was looking at some reports this morning and in the UK, the electricity prices have gone up so much that they say this winter, this new report I looked at this morning, um, electricity prices will be equal to the average amount of uh, home payments. Oh my gosh. So you're basically taking on a second home. We already saw earlier this year on the back end of last winter, UK natural gas markets were beginning to falter. Like the utilities couldn't even buy the natural gas because it was so expensive Yeah, to create electricity to send to residents. It's bad. Yeah. And then you have, uh, and then, and then you have um, all the big, um, the big fertilizer companies shutting down because they can't afford the energy inputs. So then you don't have fertilizer, well, then you don't have food. That's a problem. <laughs> That's a pretty big problem. That's a big problem. And then you have uh, Germany, which is the economic engine of Europe, right? So you have this European Union that's been thrown together by a bunch of countries. And Germany has kind of been this economic engine that kind of propels the, the EU forward. You have the pigs nations down below, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain, that are just lagging behind. They can't do anything. Greece 
Greece just announced this week that they're going to cover, I think, 95% of their energy increases of their citizens. So they're just going to pay for the difference in their energy. Yeah. Uh, but where do they get the money? They have no money, right? They're broke. They have to constantly get bailouts. And those bailouts come from like Germany. And so now the EU has this new plan called fragmentation, where they're going to take the money from uh, the, the good countries and give it to the bad countries. So they'll take it from Germany, they'll give it to Greece. But how long is that going to work for? Uh, obviously, the, Greece, the, the Germans aren't going to be happy about that. <laughs> Especially if their lights are off, they can't go to work. And they're like, hey, you're taking our money and sending it to Greece and Italy. It's yeah. But the problem is not just that, the people are going to revolt. And that's the, really the biggest problem that the world has right now is, is populism. populism, you know? Um, civil unrest. Um, but now Germany, the electricity prices in Germany have gone up so high that their manufacturing has to shut down. They can't afford to manufacture anymore. Yeah. But if they're the economic engine and they have to deindustrialize, how can they continue to push the EU forward? And the answer yeah. is they can't. The EU is, is in the process of breaking up. People yeah. don't realize it yet. So I would, I would say that most likely by the 2025, what people would expect, I said, it depends on kind of where you live. But if you're over in Europe, I would expect higher energy prices, uh, food shortages and uh, a breakup of the EU. Yeah. Yeah, big time. It's going to yeah. be difficult. It's going to be hard. And when, of course, when prices continue to go higher and food becomes scarce and the EU breaks up, it's going to affect your business, depending on what, what business you're in, right? So you need to be aware of that, um, depending on what kind of business you're in. Um, and as populism continues to rise, civil unrest continues to rise, and then, you know, you need to be aware of your own security. Right, because uh, that's gonna that that'll, that'll increase. Right, we're already seeing that happen. Even in the United States, we're seeing um, in in California, especially, um, we have these these radical DAs who have wanted to stop prosecuting crime. Gascon, who was in who ran San Francisco into the ground, is now in Los Angeles. He decriminalized um, theft under nine hundred under a thousand dollars. They decriminalized resisting arrest. What? Yeah. So if it's not illegal to resist arrest or steal under a thousand dollars, what's going to happen? People are going to steal and they're going to resist arrest. And now we have these, uh, these things, these flash mobs. And a couple of years ago, these flash mobs were kind of gaining steam and like people would show up at a square and all of a sudden start dancing or singing. No, not today. Now they all show up at one store and they just mob it. Yeah. I so saw last week, several, one of several yeah. in LA got. Stealing a bunch of junk food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was hilarious watching that because they're stealing all the junk food, the cigarettes and all that yeah. shit. And they were just like leaving the lotto tickets. So I was like, hey, you can probably. But I live in Southern California. And like, if I was there with my family, like that's a dangerous situation for me. Yeah. Right. I need to be aware of that. And so now these flash mobs are also, there's a lot of uh, theft. So now like people are marking um, their marks at restaurants and nightclubs and they're following them home and they're stealing their cars in their house, they're robbing their houses. I mean, this is getting very rampant in California right now. And so like, you need to be aware of that. Like uh, these are things that you need to be, be, uh, be aware of. And so depending on where you're at, it means different things for different people. But I would say by the 2025-ish, 2024, 2026 is kind of the cycle theory kind of heads up in that, in that range. I think we'll see the EU break up. I think uh, everything's going to come to a head, right? Everyone wonders like, how far can they kick this can down the road? How far can they kick this can down the road? And uh, the law of diminishing return shows us that, that although, you know, the Peter Schiff's and the Harry Dent's have been calling it for a decade, uh, you have uh, Ron Paul has been calling it for, for decades. They're all right. It's the timing part that's that's difficult, but that can has been kicked down the road. But the diminishing returns is just like we're getting closer, 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 closer. And I think we have you know five years till this thing comes to a head. Yeah, it's uh, it's scary. <laughs> Where it's like, and but like it's scary because I like two competing thoughts in my head, particularly in the context of Europe. Like, like I told you, I was radicalized in 2008 and then went and studied economics and the European credit crisis popped off in the early 2010s and really dove into that crisis particularly. And Michael Lewis actually wrote a book that is not one of his most popular books, is one of my favorites, which is Boomerang, which dove into like how the EU came to be and how Italy and Greece specifically got into the EU. And um, it, Goldman Sachs helped them cook the books and their debt to GDP ratios. And it became very apparent to me at that time that the EU didn't make any sense as an economic union. And it, you couldn't have Germany subsidizing the rest of Southern Europe. It's not uh, sustainable for a period of time. So I've, no, I've had this theory since like 2010, 2012, that the EU is going to break up. And it's weird because you have these conflicting views in your head. I'm like watching it. 
uh, Europe fall right now. And I'm like, yes, this should happen, but it's like hard to watch like all the hardship that comes with it because inherently I know the European Union's a bad idea. It's very communistic in a way and it shouldn't exist, but like seeing it actually degrade in real time is like, holy shit, this is heavy. Yeah. Yeah. And just like a marriage or a business partner, um, when times are good, you're open you trust and you trade. And so the world has been trading. And so back to these like shipping lanes, like, you know, you got the the oil lanes over in the Middle East, you got the Taiwan lanes over there getting microchips in and out. And um, at times of peace, everybody wants to work together and cooperation over coercion, right? So cooperation, everyone's working together, everyone's moving freely. But when people start to realize that that's falling apart, then they start to have like this protectionism just like you would start guarding your stuff if you thought your business partner was, was stealing from you. And um, it's the theory of trade expectations is what it's called. And so all of a sudden they don't want to start trading anymore. And then they start coming up with some sort of an excuse. And typically that's like a war of why we can't do that anymore. And so really it's a war. It's an economic war that we're at. And, and Trump kind of kicked it off with trade wars against China. Yeah. Um, you know, he, uh, China had been making so much money um, thanks to the trade imbalances um, and they, you know, obviously they're a communist, uh, they're run by a communist party. Um, and then they wanted to expand with their 5g system all over the world and have the spy network and Trump basically shot that down and they weren't happy about that. <coughs> you have, uh, Russia had been, been exporting all their energy to Europe. And now because of the war, now Europe can't get the energy from Russia anymore. And so we've, we've kind of, we've, we, in this three card game of poker, you're typically trying to make sure that two people don't gang, gang up against the third. But now we have Russia and China that are kind of ganging up against us. And so that's, that's shifting. But um, we have these wars, right? So now everyone's protection is in wars. And one thing you ask what people should expect in the United States, one thing that I'm super scared of right now is um, in a war um, twice in the last hundred years. Well, first, what kind of war? People talk about like a civil war. Like I, I, I'm not really expecting like a shooting war, like a hot kinetic war. It's a war. It's an economic war. And it's a war of information. All wars are wars of information, right? Even in early wars, they drop propaganda from airplanes and things like that. But it's a war of information. But just like the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, the church lost their power because they lost grip of the narrative. And so the printing press enabled people to share information quickly. And no matter what, and the state, uh, the state, the church and state would kill people, right? You'd be labeled a heretic. They'd kill you right on site, but it didn't matter. They could kill people. It didn't matter. People would still share the information and they lost their grip. Today we have the internet, right? Um, but if it's a war of information and they've lost the narrative because nobody watches CNN anymore, now they watch Joe Rogan or they listen to your podcast or whatever, we have all these alternative news sources. Well, they've lost the narrative. How can they win the war of information? And so uh, good old Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum, he talks about something uh, called the public-private partnership. Yep. Right. So a public-private partnership is the public and the government and the private companies working together. So under a public-private partnership, we have the Twitters, working uh, under pressure from the Biden administration to actively shut down and censor people, right? Alex Jones was the first sacrifice, right? Just wiped them off the face of the earth. So you kind of have this public-private partnership and the first filter is the private part. Let's get them off YouTube, let's get them off Twitter, let's get them off all that. But then most people go away at that point. But then the Alex Jones, they don't go away. Like he's crushing it more than ever now. Um, so that's where the public part comes in where it's like, well, let's put them in prison then. Yeah. Now, hey, hang on a second. This is America. We have, we, our constitution guarantees us the freedom of speech. Does it really? So twice in the last century, not ancient history, 1941, we had the Smith Act. 1918, we had the Sedition Act. Both of those said that if you say anything negative about the government, 20 years in prison. Huh. That's in the United States. It seems very communistic. Twice in the last century. Now, those were done during times of war, World War I and World War II. So you see what happens. So as the world starts breaking apart, we go into these wars, this protectionism. And then of course they grant themselves these emergency powers. And if it's a war of information, they're gonna to continue to crack down, try to win that war of information. And they'll do it with a public private partnership, privately trying to censor you. And if you still get through the filter, then publicly, we'll just put you in prison. You're going to jail. No, it was interesting in that, in this trend, I mean, I don't know if you saw it, but apparently Mark Zuckerberg was on Joe Rogan uh, this week. I didn't. In part of that conversation. So like, it's weird. Like you mentioned, like the government trying to coerce Twitter, Facebook, all these social 
media companies. It seems like Mark tried to make a mea culpa where he basically went on Rogan and said, yeah, the FBI came to us and told us to censor the Hunter Biden story. Yeah. Like literally the FBI going to Facebook and forcing them to censor news about the laptop leading up to the 2020 election. And so, I mean, I, I get maybe it's Mark just reading the tea leaves and seeing that there is this transition and social uh, posturing towards the government and he's trying to get on the right side of it. But that, I, I found that very fascinating that he felt compelled to share that information with Joe Rogan. Yeah. Like, try to get it out there. I think everybody's realizing how quick the ship is going down and it's, it's going to be covering your own ass, right? See why everyone's going to start doing that. Uh, but, but all this data came out on Twitter as well, right? Where they were pressured by the Biden administration to censor accounts like Alex Bernson, sh shut him down by on request of the government. And so uh, that's a pretty big deal. Of course, it'll probably get swept under the rug. And what I'm really afraid of, one thing I'm really witnessing is this, uh, I started writing this article. I haven't, haven't, haven't put together yet, but it's like a banana Republic USSA, right? Where it's like, um, if you look at the Alex Jones trial with the Sandy hook thing, and then you look at the, the J six thing and you look at the Mar-a-Lago thing and you look at all this, but you just zoom out and just start trying to connect dots there. Uh, the tornado cash thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what it really is, is it's a war on speech. And so they're, they're attacking it from every angle. So Alex Jones, and not to get into that whole situation, I don't even know the details, but what they're trying to say is he said mean things and he caused damages. And so that should be illegal. <laughs> uh, tornado cash is a public good, a public utility that's already protected under freedom of speech. And now that's under attack there. January 6th, supposedly Donald Trump said these things. And so each one of these things is really a communication speech issue. And they're trying to box it in every direction they can and make laws against that. Yeah, we can't let them. We can't let them, but... Um, like, that's I, the thing, like, so you talk about, like, confidence and people losing... You look at the polls, like, confidence in the federal government, all-time lows, media, all-time lows, all the banking corporations, all-time lows. Like, that's the thing. Do we have a unique opportunity here due to the information age and our ability to get this information out there, even if they're censoring? It's like whack-a-mole. You can pop up somewhere else and get your message out. You can, but not if uh, not if they pass a, a Smith Act uh, or a Sedition Act, you know, two point oh, and that's the problem. So I told my wife the other day, and I know this might be a little little over the top for some of the listeners, but I said, I think there's an above fifty percent chance, a high probability chance that in the next twenty four months I won't be able to do what I'm doing in the United States, meaning speaking out against, you know, pointing out the holes in the Fed and the government policy, and basically making fun of them or whatever, right? I probably won't be able to do that in the United States in the next 24 months. That's what I think. There's a, there's an above, uh, there's a good probability. Um, so I could either do it anonymously. I have to join the laser hoddles of the world <laughs> and go anon, or I need to do it from another country, or I need to just not say anything bad about the government. Yeah. Those, those are my options. And so, um, don't ever stop saying bad things about the government. Don't let them silence you freaks. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to be silenced. So those are my options. So I guess I can do it from another part of the world or I could do it anonymously, but you know, I don't want to be silenced either. Right. I mean, I, I think, uh, one of, one of the quotes that motivates me, it's like my driving quote is a uh, Samuel Adams. And he said that it doesn't take a majority to prevail, but rather a small irate minority keen on setting brush fires in the minds of men. And so we have to, we have to keep spreading brush fires. Um, my grandfather was a decorated Purple Heart uh, winner, uh, recipient in World War II, and my father flew flew jets in Vietnam. Pretty dangerous. I when I was born, I was he was still in the Air Force, and I just thought I would go to war one day. Growing up in that lineage, you know, um, and I guess here we are. Yeah, it's a very different type of war. It's a very different type of war, and, and I'm and I'm certainly glad I'm not storming the beaches of Normandy or uh, flying jets over uh, uh, over the Viet Cong. Um, it's a much safer war for sure, but I, I, I kind of look at, look at it as that important. Yeah. And, and again, not to put myself as the guys that were storming the beach of Normandy, those guys were friggin' men, yeah. uh, boys that were men. I mean, it's a whole nother level. I couldn't even imagine that, but today people are afraid to even speak up. That's the thing. Like self-censorship. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the, the afraid that the woke mob's going to come after them. But like you said, that's why we do this show. That's why you do your show. Yeah. Uh, like we need to light these brush fires in the mines. And yeah. it does seem, I mean, it's probably confirmation bias. We're in our little content bubbles of people who listen to our shows, but it does seem like there's more and more people who are 
beginning to wake up. And there stuff. are, there's both. It's, it's actually a bifurcation, right? So like I'm constantly amazed by how stupid and sheep the people are, but I'm also constantly encouraged by how many people are waking up. And so we're really seeing this bifurcation, but you know, uh, we talked about fun stuff, surfing. We talked a lot of doom and gloom about the world going downhill, but let's talk about this a little bit of hope. Yeah. Because I'm actually not a doom and gloomer. I believe there's massive hope and prosperity on this side. I believe in, as I see you tweet all the time, I try and tweet is like, we will win. Yeah. We will win. And so I have massive hope for my kids and my grandkids. Um, and so let's, let's talk about that for a minute. And, uh, I believe we'll win for two reasons. One, we know their system doesn't work. <laughs> There's, and we know that they know that we know that it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, like the Princess Bride. Uh, we know that they know. Uh, but uh, we have laws, natural laws, like the law of gravity. With enough money and technology, you can suspend the law of gravity temporarily, but like you always have to be holding to that law. We also have another law. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. Like you can't consume something you haven't produced. And so that's kind of where we're at. With enough money and technology, fiat, We've been able to consume without producing, but that's coming to a head. Like that will fail. Nietzsche says that which is falling um, shall ye also push. So the, the, the nation state's already falling. So how do we push it? So that's one quote. And then another, so I'll throw out three quotes. The Sam Adams quote, that quote. And then Socrates, Bucky, Buckminster Fuller's, Fuller re repeated it. But Socrates said, um, focus all your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. So I think that's how we win. And that's where I'd like to just kind of talk about for a second, because that's what you're doing and what I'm doing. And it's like, look, I can't change the education system. Why would I even try? But I can pull my kids out of school and I can homeschool them, which I have. My kids are homeschooled. Um, I can't change the media, mainstream media, but I can start my own alternative media as you have as well. I can't change the financial system, but I can just pull my money out and I can go over here. And that, that's how we win, right? If you, if you study how like the USSR fell um, in really the seventies and, and ultimately into the eighties, um, some of the, some of the great writers like Václav Havel, for example, they talk about this extensively and really it, it fell in my opinion and the research I've done um, because the people, because communism got so restrictive and it got so harsh, people were forced to go build parallel structures or parallel societies, black markets. And when they did that, when enough people opted out, then the state lost its power to control those people. So like we're here in your studio and you're like, hey, Mark, you're, you're being way too loud. Get out of the studio. And then you're over there to your editor. Hey, like, yeah, you're doing a bad job. You get out. Well, now we're gone. You have no control over us. We've started our own party out there. Yeah. Right. So you have no control over what we do anymore because we left. <sighs> and so like the more of us that leave this system to go build our own system, it does two things. One, it takes the power away from the state. And then ultimately, and this is the hope, ultimately when it inevitably collapses, it cushions the blow. And this is what happened in Russia. So many people had left the system that they lost their power. And when the USSR uh, eventually fell, it really cushioned the blow because all these parallel structures were built up. Yeah. And so they kind of went on without skipping a beat. Yeah, that's, um, there's many examples that I say that in Soviet Russia, there's a book out there um, called The Benedict Option that goes into the history of um, Benedict around Roman times when Rome was crumbling. Like the Benedictine monks just went out to the countryside outside of Rome and built their own parallel structures and they, they had a thriving sort of community and economy that was completely separate from the Roman economy and they they... They, they didn't even have a blow because they went and saw what was happening with the extravagance and the decadence and the the degeneracy in Rome. They decided to to front run it and go build their own parallel society. And that's exactly what you just described in the USSR. It's happening. It's what's happening with Bitcoin and this alternative media. And that's what drives me. It's like, yeah. all right, recognizing similarly, like we're not going to save the fiat monetary system. We're not going to save the schooling system. We're not going to save healthcare. Um, so don't so, even, don't even focus on, don't, don't waste any energy on fighting that. No, just that's like for Bitcoin, particularly with the VC fund, with what we're building to enable content creators to monetize directly via Bitcoin and what we're doing on the education side here yeah. is just an effort to as quickly as possible, build out the protocol and the stacks on top of it, the layers on top of it. And then educate people about like, hey, this is here. You can yeah. opt out at any, any point that you want. Bitcoin is what en enables all of that because without the freedom of payments, there's no freedom at all. And so obviously in the USSR, they didn't have Bitcoin, but they had 
cash that they could use, right? And today we're in a digital world, so we need a digital option, a digital cash, right? So we need Bitcoin. Um, and so Bitcoin's kind of enables all of that. And, you know, uh, yesterday here at the Commons, we were signing our books. By the way, shout out to my book, The Uncommonist Manifesto. Uh, we were doing a little book signing on that. And uh, people, I get asked all the time, as I'm sure you do as well, like, uh, you know, how, how, how can I get more involved? I want to get involved in Bitcoin. And I'm just like, go build a parallel structure. Are you a doctor? Are you a teacher? Are you in food? Like go build a system outside of their system and use Bitcoin as the base of that, right? Because we don't need money. We don't need Bitcoin. What we need is, well, we need Bitcoin, but we don't need money. What we, we don't want money. What we want is the things money buys us. So access to medical care, access to food, right? That's what we want. Money is just that medium of exchange. And so um, take your skills whatever that is as an individual and go build those parallel structures using Bitcoin as that base. That's, that's important. Yeah. And it's, it's possible today. That's it's uh, possible today. We have here, here in Texas specifically, you're really seeing it right with the beef initiative, for example, I'm out where I kind of got my ranch. We got, you know, the, the Tuckers and, uh, Tucker's really Hal Elrod preparing. and, and uh, Bill, Dell Big Tree, like they've started their own school systems out there. So we got school systems and you got, you know, all that. Um, that's one thing we do, crowd health, and then um, yeah, so medical, own medical. Yeah. I mean, all that. Yeah, and then Tucker's wife, she's got her own sort of private practice that yep. we we've uh, used as a pediatricians for our sons, and it's a fucking incredible experience. It's it's a better experience too. Yeah, it's way like, better. Like it's a uh, that's well, that's the thing though. It's it's better. But sometimes it's harder, particularly like Bitcoin, like building a business and <clears throat> accepting Bitcoin as payments and monetizing via Bitcoin due to the nation stage that the protocol is in and the tools around it are still a bit rough around the edges. It's harder, but it's worth it. Yeah. It takes time. Well, it's and, not and easy to opt out. It's not easy. That's why everybody needs to start building and helping that, right? The UI, the user interfaces will get better. Things will get easier. And so that's what we need, I think, people to go build that. Uh, another example, we we mentioned briefly earlier, like Act 6102 in 1933, right? So um, the government tricked you to get in your gold in the bank so you can get these debt instruments so you can add velocity onto the money, right? Um, and in 1933, um, because they had printed way too many of the debt instruments, they seized all the gold. And so you had all your money in the bank and the bank and the, and the government said, hey, don't, don't, don't worry, don't worry, right? It's 20 bucks, $20 per ounce of gold. So we're going to give you the $20 of uh, per ounce that you have. But then they automatically turned around and revalued it at 35 bucks. So not only did they take your gold, give these fake paper certificates, then they devalued at the same time. Now, if you didn't have gold in the bank, if you had a ranch with a hundred thousand head of cattle or a logging business or whatever you had at the time, you weren't affected by that, right? You weren't in that system. So that didn't even bother you. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Get out of the system so that whatever they do, which they're going to do a lot of crazy things, it doesn't even affect you. No, and that's... I mean, that's, I mean, the beef initiative specifically is something that I've been going. Of course, of course, I'm, first I'm raising into, my own cows now. Yeah. <laughs> People are filling their freezers with cows. I'm like, I'll just buy a couple. I got five cows now. <laughs> <laughs> and you got a good model for it too. You don't even, you're going to just keep flipping cows. Yeah. Yeah. And I showed you how you can get your own ranch, get it, get it paid for with no money out of your pocket. So yeah, I'm going to keep riding you on that. I know. I got to get, there's so much to do. There's so much to do. You got to prioritize, right? They say being busy is a lack of priorities. Yeah. So you just got to prioritize, right? That's what humans do. We're, we, we discriminate all the time. Who would have thought? Discriminate over our, our, our objectives and our, yeah. our goals. We need hierarchies. Yeah. Right. All the things they try to get rid of. And so we have to discriminate. We have to choose, you know, what's the most important thing and, and uh, prioritize. And, um, you know, for me, I think, um, my viewpoint, maybe it's extreme for a lot of listeners, but they're your listeners. So probably not too extreme for them. <laughs> They've been exposed to a lot of this stuff. Right. But like, I think there's a, there's a, a good probability that, um, you know, like I said, in the next two years, like we could see this really getting worse. And um, the way that I've always practiced my risk management as an investor is I think about like, what's the worst that can happen? If I put this amount of money into Bitcoin, what's the worst that can happen and go to zero? Am I okay with that if that happens? If I lost that money, am I okay with it? Yeah, I am, right? Okay, then I'll do it. So um, even though like maybe the threat to my family isn't that strong, there's a probability that I might need my own food and I might need a place that we can kind of live and have a good community around us. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not guaranteed by any means, um, but if I don't have that, 
what's the worst that can happen? Well, my family is screwed. I, I, as a father, it's my role to protect my family. And if I'm not prepared for that, that's a bad outcome. I'm not okay with that. And so I had to take action, right? And so that's where it ranked in my priority list. Yeah. Yeah, that's first move was getting down to Texas. Yeah. So what was going on in the Northeast? I was like, all right, let's get to a, yeah. a state that respects uh, civil liberties. But, but, but through the beef, beef initiative, you've been able to secure your own food. Yeah. So like, you know, you, you're doing, not, not everybody needs to move to a ranch on a mountaintop or whatever, right? There's other ways to do it. Even if you live in a city, you can still go secure your own food. You can still go to the farmer's market. Almost every city has one. You can still meet the local farmers. You can still build that relationship either way. Go shake your rancher's hand, freaks. Yeah. But I do want to talk about the Uncommunist Manifesto because I think what you and Alex have written is extremely important because it just highlights the, like people think we live in a, a capitalist society, democratic republic. We don't. Yeah, not even close. No. And we really need to get the message out there. Like it's, it's, it's just a mirage. Yeah. Like people say it's like, and then people try to blame capitalism. They're like, oh, capitalism got us here. It's like, we don't live in a capitalist society. And I think not even close. the one thing that all this chaos is proving is that as humans, as individuals, we really need to understand the nature of complex systems and governance systems are complex systems. And you can have a communist system or a free market system and there's trade-offs with both. And I think we would both agree that the trade-offs that come with communism have led us to this precarious situation. Definitely. And I, I, yesterday I, we were talking about it here and I said, uh, you know, communism seems like this old word and like, it's not really around anymore. Um, you could substitute communism for collectivism, right? So uh, central planners, yeah. if you will, right? So that's a, another word. But back to the point that you made um, as, as far as uh, uh, people think that this capitalist system in America failed us and it's allowed these corporations to get this point or it's allowed people to fall behind or whatever your blame is on capitalism. But to your point, we don't live in a capitalist society and it's not just this like debatable thing. No, it's actually, um, it's, it's actually quantifiable. So in the original communist manifesto, this is the uncommunist, but in the original communist manifesto, Karl Marx lays out 10 points of communism. And if you go through the 10 points, the United States has seven of them. <laughs> so like a progressive tax system, like a central bank, like, so seven of the 10 planks of communism are in the U S so it's quantifiable. We're 70% communist, right? Like um, three of the 10 had to do with taking over. Uh, well, obviously communism, central planning is taking over the means of production. Um, obviously, when he wrote the book, it was just coming out of the um, agriculture age, agrarian age into the um, into the uh, industrial revolution. Um, but three of the 10 have to do with taking over agriculture. And what are they doing today? So in Sri Lanka, they took attacked the food, right? Um, they couldn't use the fertilizer. Their crop yield went down by 50%. They couldn't export their main export, which was tea. And when they had no more exports, they had no more money coming in and the whole thing collapsed. In, in Holland right now, what are they doing? Attacking the food. In Canada, same thing, attacking the food. And even here in the US, in Pennsylvania, did you see that last week? Like they went to that yeah. Amish farm and A shut them down. Amos Miller. Yeah. Amos Miller, yeah. And so three of, this, three of the 10 planks of communism are taking over the food. And that's what we're doing. Um, you know, in, in the original Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx said, to summarize communism in one statement would be the abolition of private property. What does the World Economic Forum say? You'll own nothing. And you'll be happy. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. Right? And so what we're seeing is just the, a public-private partnership taking over means of uh, production. So it's the same thing. Yeah, and it seems like the... I mean, communism obviously has been tried many times throughout history, but it seems like this flavor of communism is driven by people who have wisened up and aren't overt about the fact that they're ushering in communism. It's like a slow drip of... Yeah. So one thing that's interesting, I have, a, I have a, another thing I was trying to start writing about that. I used to write and then um, I started making all the videos and now my writing skills have gotten a little bit weaker, uh, but I want to start writing again. But, but we did this diagram in the book right here it's kind of hard to see. Um, but basically what we said is that uh, Paul, like people want to argue that socialism is left and fascism is right. Or Republicans are right and Democrats are left or whatever. But we said, look, all of that is politics. All of that is collectivism. We are on the opposite side of this is individualism. We're not left or right. We're just out altogether. 
And what we said is that uh, we really try to defend capitalism and capitalism is a natural emergent process that all human beings do since the beginning of time. Uh, and we were, we were cavemen and you had a fire and I killed an animal and I said, hey, Marty, uh, I'll cook my animal on your fire and let's just split it. And that's, that's capitalism. And capitalism is trying to become more efficient with the limited goods that we have. <laughs> Preschoolers do capitalism, right? They're trading their chips and sandwiches or whatever it is. In prison, they have capitalism, right? They're trading cigarettes and drugs, whatever. Even in a communist society, back to the parallel societies, they have capitalism. Those are black markets. And so what happens is politics is a modality that tries to coerce and extract from capitalism. Capitalism is not a polit political modality. Pol capitalism is just being more efficient. It's human action. It's human action. That's what capitalism is. So it's not a political thing. It's not left or right. It's not, and it's not right wing or whatever. It's just, that's just what naturally we do. And of course, who doesn't think we should be more efficient with the scarce resources that we have? We should all be trying to do that. So back to kind of what you said, these different versions of it, politics is a, is like a parasite that attaches to capitalism and tries to extract from the host. Now, a parasite extracts like leeches, it extracts from the host and it tries to do it without killing the host, right? And so if it kills the host, it went too far and it dies. And so I think the first versions killed the host. So when we saw Marxism take over in the Bolshevik revolution in the early 1900s in Russia, it killed the host. When they tried to do it in, in Germany, it killed the host. They went to um, Mao's great leap forward in the 40s and 50s and it almost killed the host. And then in the 80s, they decided to bring just a little bit of capitalism back. They opened up the free ports, the free trade, and it allowed them to flourish. And so it's almost like this parasite has been trying to reinvent itself to find the right balance of how much can we extract without killing the host. Yeah. No, and it seems like that Chinese model is being exported to the rest of the world. And now too. it's being exported to the rest of the world. Yeah. Because it has, well, and that's the other thing too. I was, I don't know if I was talking about this with you last night or. I think it might've been Kelly Lannon, but like reading what's actually going on in China is so hard. Yeah. Like you see the videos of their ghost towns being imploded. You see the videos of bank runs. We saw the videos right when COVID started, people falling in the streets. It's like, what can you believe? Like, are they, because some people make the argument, Kyle Bass would, a bunch of other macro thinkers would say that the Chinese economy is in a very precarious situation. Very precarious. Yeah. So the Chinese economy is screwed back to kind of what we talked about earlier. Um, their, their, their debt bubble is so big. They can't keep printing money Two, their demographics. They're screwed. So they had this 40 year policy of one child, a one child policy. So for 40 years, they had one child, most of them all men. <laughs> they, they estimate uh, as many as maybe half a million girls were drowned at the bedside. Like, oh, we don't want a girl drown it. It's insane. Uh, but now you have, uh, you know, you have millions of boys that are 30, 40 years old with no women. Yeah, that's a pent up angry. That's a bad generation. situation. But the problem is, is that now they have all these old people and they don't have any young people. And right? so that's the way demographics work. It's like, it's a Ponzi, right? So um, as people get older, they need the younger generation to kind of keep paying for that. And so now they have all these old people without the young people and there's no, there's no fix for that. There's no fix. They need 30 year olds today. They can pay everyone in China a million bucks to have a baby, but they need 30 year olds. And, and there's just no way to get enough. them. And so just looking at the sheer numbers, this is just math. Within the next 25 years, half of the Chinese population will be gone. It's going to go under a billy? Yeah, just, just timed out. And that's just math. There's nothing they can do about it. Now they can, again, they can go on this rampant path of having babies today, but that's not going to help them in the next 30 years. And the same is for France, uh, Germany, most of Europe, Russia, um, the U.S. is a little bit better off. We had this echo boom generation, the millennial. So the baby boomer is the largest segment of the population. The baby boomer is about the same size, this echo boom. So we have like this 30 year, we kind of have about another 30 years where we're kind of okay. And then we'll probably be in the same situation. Um, Peter Zion says that uh, he predicted that uh, Russia would invade Ukraine 14 years ago by this year. And the reason why he said they would do it by this year is because their demographics were falling so fast that he said, if they don't go by now, they won't have the people in the population to do it. They just won't have enough. And so they had to go by this date or never. And, and kind of almost the same with China. That's why, that's why they're very dangerous. The, the bear poking the bear and poking the dragon. Yeah. And the, I mean, that's like one of the interesting things that Elon has said recently that he's, everybody's worried about overpopulation, overpopulation, but he's worried about depopulation. Depopulation is the problem. And that's why this whole Malthusian thing is so stupid is because, you know, he, he, Thomas Matheson, he, he, he projected this and off of this like uh, exponential growth, but just going on forever. 
I'm like, this is not how things work, right? And so um, as people come out of poverty, you have less kids, which is exactly what happened. So as China brought people from the rice paddies into the cities, they just had less kids. Well, then the one child policy and most of the developed world, um, now people wanna have one or two kids. And I'm guilty, I had two kids. I kind of wish I would have had four now. <laughs> um, and uh, that's another thing I tell you. As, as my kids got older, looking backwards, I thought two would be perfect. I kind of thought, well, we should have had three or four. We're, uh, yeah, we're um, definitely having three. Yeah. I was shocked my second's two and a half months old. My wife's already talking about the third. Yeah, I, I kind of wish we would have had more kids now looking backwards on it. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so those are, those are big problems. Um, and Thomas Matheson was wrong and we know that today, but yet we're still running on those theories. And so as Elon says, he's right, that depopulation is the problem. And not, and not a conspiracy like Bill Gates is trying to kill everybody. No, it's just, just math. Pure demographics yeah, of people pure. not having as many babies. Harry Dent wrote an amazing book called The Demographic Cliff. So anybody that's interested, uh, check out that book, Demographic Cliff. Every chart, every graph, like he's, he's really laid it down good. Yeah. No, and it's, uh, it's like... I feel, and it's weird how like the fiat system affects this too. Where like, I think kids of my generation, we're not kids anymore. We're in our thirties. I'll I still call a, you a kid. I have a lot of, I have a lot of friends and f extended family members who decided like they would like to have kids, but they feel like they can't. Right. It's too can't. expensive. Yeah. It's too expensive. They don't, they just don't feel like they could take on the burden and that's, well, and, 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 and now, now they're telling people, right, it's, it's bad for the environment. Don't have kids. You know, human impact on the earth is bad. Um, they're praising people for having abortions. Let's kill as many kids as we can. Right. <sighs> and, um, and, and that's all, and back to the book. I mean, that's all Marxism. So, uh, back, back into the book and bringing it, the book, the old book into relevance. Um, it was an attack on the family. So Karl Marx basically said that, uh, one, there's two arbitrary classes, poor and rich. And if you're rich, you're an oppressor. And if you're poor, you're oppressed. Um, and he said that the poor have nothing of value. All they have is their labor. So that's all obviously wrong. And he paints them as victims. And today we have cultural Marxism or neo-Marxism where now it's not just two arbitrary groups. Now it's black and white and male and female and gay and straight and just you name it. Everybody's against everybody and everybody's a victim. And so now it's like this victim Olympics where everyone's trying to get to the lowest common denominator. And if I'm a victim, then I need a savior. So there's no way I can get ahead unless the state helps me. Um, but then he, then he attacks the family. So he wants to break down the family. He says that the, the he says the bourgeoisie, the poor, um, they look at their family as purely as economical. And women's are really just the means of production and women should just be shared collectively. That's what he says. I'm like, have, have feminists read this? Because I can't imagine they'd be okay with that. Um, kids are purely economical, he says. And so he really talks down the family, wants to break apart the family. And re the reason why they want to break apart the family is because they don't want there to be any support systems. They don't want you to have any property. They don't want you to have any support systems of the family or the church, because if you have no support systems and no money, then you're solely dependent on one thing. And so back to kind of this, uh, you know, attack on the family, don't have kids, it's bad for the environment. You know, uh, corporations are paying people 4,000 bucks to go have an abortion today. They don't pay you to have a baby, but they'll pay you 4,000 to kill one. Um, that's all Marxism. Yeah, they're trying to destroy the family and, it's evil. You see it in the schools now too, like with the the big trend of like every every kid transitioning, and now you openly have teachers and guidance counselors going like, "We will protect you from your parents. Yeah. You can tell me anything, yeah. we, and we will not tell your parents. We'll help you get a medical procedure without telling your parents." Yeah. It's just crazy. And that, and that's escalated. What it used to do is they were putting flyers all over these kids and uh, kids schools and showing them like all these different orientations they could be whatever. And then what they wanted and what they've done is then the parent, the kids go home to their dad or the parents at the dinner table, hopefully if they're still doing that. And they say, Hey, I think I'm a sis, this, that, whatever. And the dad's like, hang on a second. No, you're not. And then the kid goes, you don't understand me. And then whoosh. communication cut. Yeah. Like you don't understand me. And, and, uh, yeah, it's become a big problem, but that, that's just Marxism brought on. And, and it's important to understand it for what it is. So then you can understand the relevance of what we're seeing today. And only when you understand the problem, can you then start to come up with a solution for it, right? Um, but, it's, but it's a big problem. Another thing that it's done is it's, like I said, it's painted everybody as victims. And it's really, I think uh, Alex and I really spent a lot of time thinking about like, why is it so infectious? Like, why do so many people want it when it seems so bad? And really, you know, we have our, our human nature. I would even call it like our human sinful nature. And so it, it, it appeals to greed and envy 
and slothfulness, right? So it gives us justification for being uh, lazy. It gives us justification for uh, stealing from other people, right? Being envious of what they have. And mm -hmm. it gives us a plan to take it from them greed, right? And so it really appeals to that. And you can see if you if you play that out back to, you know, I'm sure, you know, we talk a lot about incentives and, and you can see how that starts to play out. So instead of cooperation, we have coercion, right? Which is never good. Um, it's a multiplication, multiplicative up if we're cooperating or it's also down if we're stealing from each other. Um, and then we have all these people trying to race to the bottom, become bigger and bigger victims. And then you have all this greed and envy and slothfulness. And so society just, just circles the drain on the way down. And so um, this is a book of hope. And so we, we're trying to encourage people to be better versions of themselves. Look, you're not a victim. You don't have, you have things to offer. At a time when he wrote this, they have nothing to offer but their labor. Um, but today, like intellectual capital, now you can make money just talking yeah. or writing or whatever. And so we, everyone has, everyone has something to offer. Um, and we encourage everyone to be better versions of themselves instead of falling to the common denominator, lowest common denominator. Yeah. And it's also like highlighting, it, it may come off as like, like doomer, but like, it's actually very optimistic and hopeful. It's like these systems, like we talked about the parasite and the evolution of the communist system, but in, inevitably they do collapse upon themselves because they yeah. just, completely ignore human nature human part nature. of human nature is like the nuclear family like you're never going to get rid of that it's hard well without try. a male and a female you don't have any people <laughs> like, like civilization ceases to end yeah it's kind of funny now that i have this little ranch out here and you know we have these goats and these cows and um uh we have like the a bunch of female goats and then we have like a one billy goat and uh Man, that friggin' Billy goat's horny, dude. It's like <laughs> sniffing those friggin' goats. It's trying to get after those goats so hard. And I was just thinking like, you don't have to tell these goats which ones are male and female. You don't have to tell them what to do. Like they know like procreating, like extending their life is like, that's just part of what humans do. It, but, but, but today our society is trying to teach that out of us. Yeah. But like, can that, can, is that even possible? Like it can, it's obviously gotten to an extreme and there is, uh, a very visible disconnection uh, in pop culture. Uh, I, I don't think it's possible in the long run, in the short run. So like yeah. I said, with enough money and technology, they can distort things. But what we're seeing, even, you know, we're seeing all these horror stories of all these kids that transitioned young and now they're trying to come back out of it. Right. So I think uh, they, kids are so young and impressionable and you have little kids and my kids are older now, but now that my kids are older, I mean, whenever I see like these little kids, I just, oh man, they just seem so innocent and they're just so, so impressionable and like we need to protect them right like we need to protect them and we're like totally exploiting them and it like breaks my heart and like you know like kids want to be an astronaut or they want to be a unicorn and it's like well okay like you can be a unicorn and i'll dress you up as a unicorn but like you're not yeah right? and it's like that's like our job as parents <laughs> right like oh it's insane yeah. my son will not be a fairy I can, uh, <laughs> yeah, I grew up with three sisters and my parents tell me when I was a kid, my sisters would put me in a dress and like, I'd play with them, but like, so what, right? It didn't mean I wanted to be a girl. Yeah. Today, you know, your teacher finds out that and they're like, oh, how can we help you, uh, take puberty blockers? Man, I see like th some of these, uh, videos like libs of TikTok or whatever. And they show like these coming out, uh, um, whatever they are not coming out parties, but, um, when parents announce the sex of their child or whatever, and you'll see these people with like a two or three year old kid next to them and like pop a, like a, a thing, a balloon or whatever. And like, oh, they decided to change the sex. And the little kid's like clapping. And the kid's like two. Oh, I mean, they're clapping because the freaking balloon went off. Yeah. But like, gosh, man, like, oh. But that's, but that's Marxism. And, and uh, part of it also is, um, and this is, this is a big piece too, is like um, getting rid of truth. Oh yes. Right. Getting rid of truth. And so like what, like what happens when you tell kids or people that there's no such thing as truth and uh, everything, you know, two, two, two plus two is five and they can do anything they want. They can be anything they want. There's no such thing as sexes and people grow up without that foundation and they lose their friggin' minds. Yeah. Society at large loses. I mean, and this is like, again, you want to talk about like Marxist like tendencies throughout history. I mean, it's exactly like if you go into like the history of the Weimar Republic outside of the hyperinflationary crisis as you dive into the, the degeneracy of their society, the parallels are stunning. Yeah. They became obsessed with gender. They became obsessed with sex and promiscuity. And yeah. What's interesting, a little known tidbit that most people don't know. Um, if you want to look at the Russia, Ukraine situation and um, 
just as a disclaimer, not trying to be a fanboy of Vladimir Lenin or Putin um, and say what he's doing is correct. I mean, I don't think any nation should try to take another nation over, but I think what we're really witnessing is a war of globalism. And so there's, there's two interesting par parallels. One, um, Trump went to Davos in 2017 and gave a speech and he said, the U S is sovereign. Like we're never, he pulled us out of the Paris Accord. The U S is sovereign. We're never going to lay down our sovereignty. We'll work together, but like, we're going to be a sovereign nation. My job is to do the best for the American people, make America great again. And he became the number one target of globalists around the world. They had to get him out at no cost. Well, Putin went to Davos and gave a speech in October of 2021. And in that speech, he said, um, he said, uh, oh, all you uh, Western nations that you think you're so progressive. He says, you think that progress is blurring the lines between sexes? You think that progress is breaking down the family? He said, that's not progress. He said, it's the same dogmas as taught by Marx and Engels. That's what he said. It's the same dogmas as taught by Marx and Engels that led to the Bolshevik revolution. He said, we want nothing to do with that. That was October of 2021, right before he became enemy number one of the entire world. Yeah, four months later, uh, everything popped off. But it's like, yeah, it's like, it's, I've had this guy London Paul on uh, a couple times now to describe. He's been a you know, very contrarian in regards to what's going on between Russia and Ukraine, contrarian compared to the mainstream media. But like having conversations with him, and he just explained the history of like the Minsk agreement and uh, the encroachment of the UN um, and NATO nations like around Russia's border and just like just methodically and logically walked through the thought process that Russia probably had going into this. And it was like, yeah, they're, 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 you, NATO nations were breaking the Minsk agreement and they brushed up on his border and he just felt like a, an animal backed in the corner and had to do something about it. And even trying to see that perspective and putting it out there labels you like a Putin apologist. Yeah. It's just like, we've got, again, getting back to your point of like, when you try to blur truth, it's like, if, especially here in America where we value um, free speech, liberty, and hopefully logic at the end of the day, we should be able to be mature adults to try to have a very analytical and uh, objective observation of what's going on there. And like, you can't even bring up the truth of like, hey, NATO did sort of brush up on his border and break those agreements. It's like, no, 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 that doesn't matter. Well, it's, if you notice, um, there's no such thing as logical arguments or agreements anymore. Now everything's emotional. So they've turned everything to be emotional now. So whether you're talking about vaccines or whether you're talking right. about kids or whether you're talking about Ukraine, it's all emotional. And you can't, you can't win an emotional conversation. You can only win a logical one. You can't really win it, but you could have that discussion, right? And so to your point, um, that's one of the things that they've been successful in doing is turning everything into emotional. Like, um, and I get it. I mean, whatever. Like I feel bad for the Russians and Ukrainians. I don't want anyone dying. Like that sucks. And I, I would imagine any war, like um, the people don't hate each other. It's the friggin' leaders that are causing all the problems. So I feel bad for the people that get caught in the middle of that, you know, no matter what nation they're in. Because I would imagine the Russians don't hate Ukrainians and back and forth. Some, some do, I would imagine, right? But- um, part of that too, um, and again, I mean, I'm not an apologist and nor am I really an expert in it. It's something I've studied a lot in the last six months, but you know, they, not only had they amassed their troops on the border, but along that Donbass border, um, they had the Nazis, the yeah. of Nazis, right? And so Nazis, you think of Germany, but Nazis are just national socialists, right? And so they're nationalists that hate other cultures. And so you had these, uh, <coughs> a lot of Ukraine is Russians. The Russians are still living in Ukraine. And so um, the Nazis were attacking the Russians that were living there. They were shelling them, right? So they were blowing them up. And, um, you know, remember Biden kept saying, oh, by next Wednesday, they're going to attack. Okay, next Tuesday, they're going to attack. Like, how did Biden know they would attack on Wednesday? Like, were they announcing it? Well, I think the reason why is because they were shelling the Donbass. They were shelling the Russians there. And it was... Okay, if we if we do this bombing, for sure they're going to attack. Oh, that didn't do it. Okay, well let's do this bombing, and then for sure they're going to attack. Um, doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just interesting to to, to kind of look at it and, and analyze it. Yeah, I mean, and considering the the history of the U.S. government and particularly the intelligence agencies that run throughout it, like to think that there isn't some type of incitement from our side again, it's just not objective observation of yeah. what has happened historically. I think. CIA yeah. has done terrible things around the world the in, FBI. in the name of freedom. 
the FBI, yeah, the CIA, yeah, FBI at home, CIA abroad. Supposedly, the U.S. is the only country that can bomb other nations. Yeah, right. With impunity. Any, anyone else bomb someone like Russia? That's a big deal. But the U.S. drops bombs nonstop under Obama. They can constantly drop bombs on the Middle East. You yeah. Know? Yeah, Biden just started bombing Somalia again, yeah. apparently. So the U.S. can do it all day, but no other countries. And I, I hate to say it. I mean, look, I mean, I got the Statue of Liberty tattooed on my arm. I'm like, I bleed red, white, and blue, right? Um, and uh, I, I've, I've been joking, but maybe serious. Like, I kind of need to put a tat, uh, tattoo, like a little teardrop right here, right? I mean, Lady Liberty's crying right now. So um, it's not not because I'm not a patriot. I bleed it. But, um, man, it's it's sad to see see what's happening. Yeah. And, and especially and now, even now they're supposedly per the DHS and the Biden administration, the biggest threat in America today, you know what they said it is? Domestic terrorists. White nationalists. Yeah. That's the biggest threat. Really? Not BLM or Antifa burning down cities, not uh, bombing and, and blowing out the, uh, you know, the uh, pregnancy centers. Like uh, the biggest threat is white nationalists. Like what have they even done? Like what were the targets? Like, so it, it makes me sad. Are we white nationalist? I'm not white. I'm I'm uh I'm um uh, I'm part Mexican. I'm uh <laughs> I'm Irish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's yeah, you, the DHS they came out with that and I think in conjunction with the FBI they came out with that flyer like look out for these flags and it's like the don't tread on me come and yeah. take it like this sort of move the Betsy Ross flag. Uh, yeah. Freedom is a dirty word. Freedom is right-wing extremism. And that's like the most frustrating part. Like you said, like I'm, uh, like I fucking love America or at least the ideals that this country was founded on. Obviously we've gotten far away from them. Like I went to fight for freedom in the United States, but it's just like that weird dichotomy of being an American who loves the ideals that we're finding on, founded on and is trying to live towards those ideals and create a reality in which my children have the ability to strive for those ideals. And then you're just stuck with this government that is completely yeah. against it, it seems. And the scary part is to your point that the government, the leaders that we have, like they're, they're, they're driving the bus towards a cliff and we can all see that cliff coming, shutting down our energy, you know, taking over agriculture and manufacturing, you know, continuing to stir in the pot with these identity politics. I mean, all these things we're doing, they're driving it off of the cliff and they're not turning the freaking wheel or hitting the brake, dude. <laughs> fucking hitting the anode too. Yeah, button. right. And <laughs> so, so, so it's super scary from that. And and I think most people, I do. I'm a, I'm an optimist. That's why I'm an entrepreneur. Um, so I, I'm an optimist, and uh, we all have biases we have to be aware of. And so I'm always trying to check my optimism bias because I think everything's always going to be okay. But we've had some really bad times in history, and but I try to I, I try to so I try to kind of balance that. Um, so it's really scary to see where it's going, but. I have hope, maybe it's my optimism bias, but I have hope just because, like I said, we know it won't, it will fail. And I believe that the human drive for freedom uh, will far exceed that. And um, we have the tool now that we need to win. And so, um, yeah, a lot of doom and gloom is super, super, super scary. I think there's more pain ahead, but. Yeah, it's one thing we need to figure out on the narrative front is how, how do you make opting out appealing? Um, well, we need to build enough parallel structures so, yeah. so it's easy to opt out. Yeah, make it seem fun. Like not like you're doing something dirty because I think that's a lot of people feel like there's this connotation of oh you're adopting Bitcoin you're mm -hmm. uh, buying beef from your ranch you're, you're using crowd health or something like that like that's uh yeah. that's risky. One thing I've been kind of thinking about lately and I've been kind of kind of getting turned off although like all my videos on YouTube uh, just search Mark Moss on YouTube they're all um, I look at it like a hunter and a farmer so like. Um, I talk about like the Fed or I'll talk about geopolitics and I talk about the problems, but Bitcoin's always the solution. But I'm grabbing people who don't think about Bitcoin and then showing them how Bitcoin solution versus like a, a podcast that just talks about Bitcoin only, right? And they're they're talking to the to the choir. Yeah. And you need both. This is awareness and then we need uh, depth, right? And so you, you kind of have both. So even though I even though I spend my time talking to the to the no coiners, maybe um, top of the funnel. Top of the funnel. There's so many people that are focused and here we're at BitBlock Boom this weekend. And like so many people are like, I think there was a workshop today on like how, how to orange pill people. And I'm just like, nah, we don't need to orange pill people. We don't need to push mass adoption. Um, no one needed to push for mass adoption of the internet. No one needed to do that. People who started using the internet just because it was a better way, it was easy. And so kind of to your point you're making, um, as if, if it's easy, like, hey, wouldn't you rather know where your, where your meat came from? 
and like check it out. You can watch it grow and like you can you can shake your farmer's hand. Like, isn't that cool? Look how easy that is, how fun that is. People will do that without really needing to know that they're subverting the state and they're trying to bring it down. Yeah. Right. And so I think that's the way it's done. Yeah. No, go shake your rancher's hand. It's fun. Uh, The first time I did it here, I brought my wife and my son. Um, We hopped in his truck. He drove us around the ranch. Uh, My son was popping out of the window, like sitting on my lap in the front seat. Yeah. It's a good family activity. Yeah. And and, and with school. So like, uh, hey, look, um, schools, people are falling behind in school. Um, That's not, you know, it's indoctrination, whatever. Um, Here's like these homeschool pods. Look how much they're learning. Look how fast they're advancing. It's just a better model. And it's easy. You don't, again, it's not because we're sort of subverting the bank, the state, we're trying to bring it into it. No, it's just like, it's a better model. And it's just, and so that, that's, that's how we do it. Right. Yeah. Which is why we need people to continually build these things and then it will improve, right? The user interface will keep getting easier and easier. Yeah. I'm actually very bullish on like better design coming to the Bitcoin stack than like what Tucker's doing with the schools and stuff like that. That's like one thing. Our oldest is two and a half and it's still, they're still even with my wife. I'm like, and she's very receptive to and open to it, but it's still like a bit jarring for people to say, oh, especially if you talk to like extended family members, like, yeah, we're not really thinking about sending our our sons to to public school. Yeah. Um, I, uh, growing up in Southern California or in South Texas, tell us in junior high, um, <clears throat> my parents were pretty grassroots politically organized. Uh, they, they, they're pretty in deep and we still talk, talk politics at the table. Like that's how my family is, is how I was kind of raised. And my, my parents homeschooled me for a bit when I was a kid in Texas and like, it was like illegal back then. Um, which is probably why I think a little bit differently today. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then when I was in California, I went to just private Christian school, um, so I didn't really grow up in public school, but when my kids went into school, my, I put my kids into public school and, um, I kind of knew that I probably shouldn't, but I did anyway. And there's, a, there's, there's pros and cons, right? And part of the pros is being part of that community. And so now we know everybody in the community and it was a big piece of that. Um, but when the pandemic broke out and schools were shut down in California, schools have been shut down right for two years. And so our kids went to homeschool and then it was like, what the hell have I been thinking this whole time? And so my youngest is uh, in eighth grade. And it's like, you'll never, she, she's been out since sixth grade. It's like, you'll never go back. And she's, she's bummed. She's super bummed. She wants to go to high school with all her friends. And I'm like, I'm sorry. It stands for everything I'm against. Yeah. And, and it just won't happen. So uh, we're adamant about it. My parent, my wife's on board with it, luckily. And yeah, homeschool is the only way from here on out. Are there, like, do you see your daughter learning more? I don't care about the learning. There ain't nothing to learn in freaking school. <laughs> I, I believe, I mean, you, you, you learn how to read and write, learn, yeah. learn arithmetic, like you're done, man. You don't, what else are you going to learn? And so what, uh, are you taking like the approach of like, all right, find out what you're interested in. We'll figure out how to, I make them read a lot of book. Well, I, I pay them. I, I make them and I pay them to read a lot of books. <laughs> so, uh, so my, my oldest just graduated high school. And, uh, you know, she grew up reading economics in one lesson. She read the case against socialism. She's read rich dad, poor dad. I mean, my, she's read all these books. Right. Um, and so, you know, she's a free thinker, even though she was in the indoctrination camp and what's crazy. And, and this is what really gets me. Even my youngest, who's been out of school since sixth grade. Now she's in eighth grade. Like they argue with me over these social issues, like the environment, for example, like my youngest, we got into an argument on Halloween. She was saying she couldn't wear a feather in her hair because it was like cultural appropriations or whatever. I'm like, what? I'm like, hang on, hang on, hang on. And I'm like, and like, we're like arguing over this. I'm like, like, and, and like, we have a pretty tight family, right? Like I try to have, you know, influence over my, over my kids. Right. And like, um, I'm arguing, like my, my daughter's trying to argue about cultural appropriations. Like, hang and And you start to see how deep that is. And even my oldest now, like she gets mad at me because I'm like, look, Michaela, this is not how that is with the environment. Let me, let me show you this. Right. And sh- she'll get mad, you know? It, it's it's hard to counteract that, even if you're super engaged. If you're not super engaged, I mean, it's impossible. Yeah. No, you have, it's you have to be vigilant as a parent. Becoming super vigilant, and 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 again, and you know what you know what that is. It really goes into back into communism, um, and uh, another concept I've talked about quite a bit extensively is the the blow off top of socialism. And so when you look at a blow off top, we talked about earlier, like the Bitcoin or the housing market, when it runs out of buyers. Then you get, it's super volatile and then it blows off. And so what's happened, I, I believe socialism is also approaching a blow off top, right? Where we've, hey, state, handle my education. Hey, state, handle my healthcare. Hey, state, handle my retirement. Hey, state, hand, like everything. We've just handed off, handed off, handed off, handed off. And uh, eventually there's nothing else to hand off. And then it blows off. Um, but, you know, we want to outsource all of that. And uh, you're the parent, man. Teach your kids. Yeah. No, it's... I think the uh, the concept of it takes a village is very true too. That's why I feel fortunate to have a big extended family. We're very close. My brothers, 
my brother and sister with my wife's sister, um, her husband and their kids, and then my cousins and their kids like in the summers. It's all of us who have grown up together. Like my wife was my best was best friends with my cousin growing up. And so that's cool. Our parents know each other well. Her parents know my extended family well. And then in the summers it's it's pretty crazy. I think now you have three generations. You have the grandparents, our parents, you have us, and then our kids, and you have that sort of tribe like right there. And the kids see it too. Which is like we saw it when we were growing up. Like it, when I was growing up as my grandparents who've since passed, my parents and then us, the kids. Mm-hmm. Now we've sort of taken that and replicating that. Yeah. And it's, yeah. I think for like from my experience as a kid seeing that, seeing my parents, my mom with her brothers and sisters and their parents and their extended friend groups that were close on the island. Um, it really affected me. It's like, oh, this is what I need to do when I grow up. Like we need to be close with our family. Yeah, and, it's big. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I don't think, yeah, for, I'm not a big fan of school. I mean, I graduated high school. I didn't, I didn't go on to form, formal education. I've learned a lot. And, and, I, and I always tell my kids, look, I'm not into formal education, but like I've read thousands of books. I have this giant library and I make my kids read all these books. So like, I love education. I just want to learn what I want to learn. So like learn to read and write, like you got that. And then like, I have my kids, like my, my oldest daughter, I had to do, do Hillsdale College. Have you seen that? So like uh, Hillsdale College is a college, but you can do it online as well. And they have all kinds of classes on the constitution, on early, early the U S the revolution. <laughs> so, you know, I want my kids to learn history. I want them to learn the history of America. Um, like I said, I want them to study socialism and communism. I want them to learn business. So I've had them involved in my business. I think one of the things that helped me was working with my dad as an entrepreneur, right? he's a contractor. It's like peeling back the curtain and showing them how money's made and how value's created. So I've had them involved in that. And, um, I think there's a lot of things they need to learn. They need to learn how to manage their time, manage their body. They need to learn um, communication skills. So like how to win friends and influence people. My daughter's read that twice, right? Like those are things that people need to learn. Communication skills, yes. time management skills, like personal development skills. And that's something that's being completely uh, ripped out of this generation with. My youngest daughter's been doing that uh, synthesis.io. I don't know if you heard of that before. I have heard of that, yeah. Uh, I think Pomp talked about it quite a bit. It was uh, like a school that like Elon Musk had built for his kids. Mm-hmm. And now they've kind of made it a little bit bigger. It's like an after school program and she logs on a couple hours uh, at a time per day, uh, a couple times a week. And it's all like creativity exercises and they make kids like work together to solve problems. Like really out of the box creative thinking. And so- that's what I think it takes to be successful. And so that's what I'm having yeah. my kids work on. There's new models. I mean, I went to the schooling system. I, I, was, I've inter- I went to Catholic school. I went to a friend's school. That was very interesting. The Quakers run a very... Quakers? Yeah. Wow. They, they run a very interesting style of schooling. Then I went to public school. I went back to Catholic school for high school and college. But past high school, my, my high school was very good. I learned a lot in high school. And I'm happy that I went to the one I did. But college... I learned more on YouTube than I did. Four yeah. Years and, th- and that's the other big thing. Um, really in the last 12, 13 years, the world's completely changed. And I say 12, 13, cause the iPhone came out in 2007. So really since 2007 is when really when the internet like really accelerated. Right. And, and the world's just changed. So, so now with, 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 with YouTube and, and Google, like you can learn anything and really, you know, there's the whole, you know, it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert kind of a thing. But like for the most part, with about four or five hours on YouTube, you could become about a 60, 70% expert in a lot of things. So like I wanted to build out my studio and I didn't know anything about soundproofing. So I spent like four or five hours watching videos and reading all these documents. And like, I know a lot about soundproofing a studio now, right? Or you want to learn how to scale a TikTok or Instagram account. Within about four or five hours, you can learn pretty much everything you need to know about the algorithm and how to scale an Instagram account, right? So social, social media management, for example, right? And so like, um, I, I hired a girl at my office and she just graduated from a prestigious college and, and with a degree in marketing. And she's knows less than zero. Hopefully she's not listening. Uh, she knows less than zero uh, because like she thinks she knows stuff, but she doesn't. And she, I was like, I'd rather hire a 13 year old kid that's grown an Instagram account because at least <laughs> they've done it. And so like the, the, the information's changed, the world's changed. And so, yeah, we have to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. You, can, you, you learn more from experiences than from reading books or like reading textbooks, like or being taught by a professor who's never actually entered the workforce. So there's three this. levels of learning, right? So there's there's the learning it, the reading it, then there's the doing it, and then there's the teaching it. And so like you're doing, you know, you're learning, doing it, and then you're teaching it right through this show. I do the same thing with my show. Um, and so learn it and then do it. And, and um, that's why I have like thousands of books and it's like, oh, I'm hiring people. I should read a book on human resources. Oh, I'm trying to grow it. I should read a book on marketing. <laughs> like, you know, and like you're learning what you need and then you're using it 
right there. And then eventually you go and you teach it. And then you go and you teach it. Yeah. But from experience. Yeah. No, experience is the best. That's like, again, going back to this business, it's like been iterative. I had no idea what I was doing. And then I got smarter about how to make money. Now I'm getting smarter about growth. Yeah. Like, it's fun too. And hopefully it has an impact. That's, uh, I mean, that's the reason I started. I was like, oh, I just want to teach people about Bitcoin now. I'm able to sustain my life on it. And, but still trying to stay true to that initial sort of ethos and goal of the content and make sure you don't like sell out or anything. Like yeah. That. Yeah. Because that's what people want too in this modern day, like alternative media. They want authenticity. For sure. Because the they're not getting it anywhere. People are starved for authentic people or aren't afraid to speak the truth. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. It's been a f great conversation. A lot different than I had expected it to go when we sat down. <laughs> I thought we were, you know, I was like, oh, we'll talk about the three cycles and we'll talk about where the world's going. We'll talk about the way the government's probably going to get out of this financial repression. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it was a great conversation. Super fun. Yeah. Well, at, hopefully, hopefully everybody enjoyed it. Where can people pick up the Uncommunist Manifesto? So yeah, check it out. Uncommunist Manifesto. Um, again, lighting brush fires in the minds of men. It's probably super cheap. And it's a, it's an actually, it's only about 10,000 words. Most people can read it in about an hour. So it's not like one of those big books for like human action where you're afraid to pick it up. Um, and so just go to Am Amazon. Um, yes, we're using the state's uh, platform to sell a book, uh, <laughs> but we're going to use their platform against them as long as we can. Yeah, they make it very easy. They make it very easy. So I'm still using YouTube because I can reach a lot of people on YouTube as well. But um, just go to, um, un, um, you can go to uncommunist.com or you can go to Amazon and search uh, Uncommunist Manifesto there and check it out. And um, we'd love it if you bought a couple of books and just shared them or just, or just read it and then just share the information that you get, right? Yeah. Read it, think about it and just share the ideas. Yeah. Because it's important, like you said earlier, to understand the problem. You can't solve a problem unless you understand it. And this helps uh, understand the problem that we find ourselves in. Yeah, we try to take it down to like a first principles level so that you can then build your own ideas on top of it. Because people yeah. today, they don't really take the time to understand at that level and then they just kind of parrot headlines. And when they're challenged, they don't understand it. So we break it down to like a first principles level so you can really understand it at the core and then you can formulate your own ideas on top of it. Yeah. So yeah, check it out. Uncommunist.com or just go to Amazon, Uncommunist Manifesto. Get back to first principles, freaks. That's right. Go check out Mark Moss's YouTube uh, page as well. Incredible content. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. A lot of stuff on the macro and the geopolitics. It's all about Bitcoin, but uh, in a roundabout way. Yeah. No, it's, it's that. I think that's the, uh, the best strategy is like broad top of the funnel. Here's the problem. And then no. Uh, you may want to look into this as a solution. Yeah. And then, and then there's plenty of podcasts that dive deep into it, but we all, we all play our part, you know? Yeah. Well... Let's go have a fun weekend. Let's do it. I'm looking forward to going eating some steak. Yes, I am as well. I've had a lot of steak already this week, but I can always have more. Always have more. All right. Peace and love, freaks. Okay.